Well, we are now on. Uh, thank you, Flavio. We are live. Welcome, uh, Renza, Bjorn, Olavo, Malcolm. Hi, everybody. I I'd like to welcome you all. I will start to sharing my presentation uh, because of all the things I must. I ask you to forgive me. I'm not the technologist anymore. Um, please tell me if you are looking. You, if you are. Uh, if you are seeing my my presentation, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, nice, nice. I will put this on. So, uh, bom dia para todo mundo. Uh, Bem-vindos ao nosso workshop sobre rigor, uh, reprodutibilidade, uh, reprodutibilidade, e gestão de dados, em pesquisa, gestão de dados, clínica, em pesquisa, não. Todas clínica, as nossas atividades, todas as nossas serão atividades feitas em inglês aqui serão feitas. Então nós já inglês, vamos mudando. De, então nós já vamos mudando. De prosa. prosa. I'm, I'm José, Marino José Marino Neto from the from Institute, Institute of Biomedical Engineering of, of the Federal, Federal University, University of Santa, of Santa Catarina. Catarina. From from now on. on. Uh, uh, referred as Yabiufsky. I'd like to welcome uh, you all to our workshop on the behalf of um, an extraordinary international partnership uh, formed by the Yabiufsky uh, and also uh, the Partnership for Assessment and Accreditation of Scientific Practice, the PASP, and the Enhancing Quality in Preclinical Data, EQIPD Consortium. I warmly welcome you in behalf of this whole partnership. Um, so, as you can see, um, our program our program brings together a group of remarkable scientists who are making huge contributions to the promotion uh, of rigor and quality in non-clinical research. Over the next uh, three and a half hours, they will share with you some of the best theoretical and practical insights available uh, into the factors that contribute, contribute to poor reproducibility and research and to flawed data management. And of course, uh, we'll talk also on the ways to get around these factors. Uh, I would like to heartily thank them all, thank uh, Henza, Malcolm, Thomas, Bjorn, and Olavo for their contributions and for finding time to join us today. Um, before going ahead, I'd like to uh, also thanks to Dr. Um, Renato Garcia Ojeda, the head of EAB Ufsky, for his enthusiastic support for this workshop. Special thanks goes to Flavio Garcia Pezzola, who prepared all the technology and the advertising for this uh, workshop, and who is taking care of us, of the whole thing right now. Terrific, Flavio, thank you. Super thanks to uh, Dr. Bjorn Gerlach, who was the one who built the program and brought together the fantastic group of scientists you will watch today. Finally, I'd like to thanks to Dr. Silene Lino de Oliveira from the Behavioral Neurobiology Lab of our university for her su support during the preparation of this event and for nurturing at its very beginning this partnership between Yabiewski and PASP. I, I'd like also to pass some information to our audience. We invite you to ask your questions at any time during the workshop via chat or via the email address that will appear somewhere here. Um, all questions are welcome, but Due to time limitations, I'm, uh, I'm afraid that only a few of them will be answered here. But we will try to answer all of them even after the workshop. 
In addition to English, you can also ask questions in Portuguese or Spanish. We will also have some pools by which you can interact with the speakers and help us to improve future workshops. Um, the links will be shown, we uh, were sent to you and will be shown uh, somewhere here. Well, our public today is a fantastic mix of uh, life science researchers and of biomedical engineers. Uh, why? Why? Why these engineers must be engineers? Uh, uh, biomedical engineers must be concerned with uh, what appears to be a life science people's problem. Um, but as we shall see, it's not. And more importantly, how could they help uh, alleviate these problems? Um, well, um, let's start here. Mostly in the last two decades, the scientific community have been made aware of a concerning type of evidence indicating uh, poor reproducibility of findings reported in scientific papers. As an example, in, uh, in uh, Nature's um, report by Monia Baker, uh, here, nearly, one, nearly 1,500 scientists took an online survey on uh, reproducibility in research. This is one of the telling figures that emerged from the survey. When asked, have you failed to reproduce an experiment? more than 70% of the researchers answered they failed to reproduce another scientist's experiments. And more than half stated that, that they failed to reproduce their own experiment, experiments. I, I would like to highlight here that these troubles are not, are not confined to life science. In fact, it appears to affect equally life science and engineering. So that's one of the reasons by which biomedical engineers should uh, get worried. Um, well, that survey and a huge number of other reports have indicated several causes for poor reproducibility in science. They range from poor biased study design, insufficient common of statistical tools, lack of transparency in reporting, the methods, um, well, in brief, poor, less than rigorous scientific practices. Several measures have been proposed to address these problems. And one of them is what we are doing today, to offer, to offer more awareness and better training to the scientists, so to allow them to incorporate better scientific practices, practices uh, to their routine. Um, but uh, we are, uh, uh, what are the other reasons by which biomedical engineers should be concerned with these problems? Um, well, uh, we, life science scientists and biomedical engineers, have identical challenges. I, I will use um, the Yabiufsk vision and activities as a template to answer these questions. Uh, this will help to explain our enthusiasm with uh, our partnership. Uh, the, for example, the, the Yabiewski is committed to devise, develop, and form on frontline technologies um, to support healthcare. Most of the typical biomedical engineering developments involve tests, experiments in humans and animals that are designed, conducted, and analyzed by methods and ethical standards that are identical to those of non-clinical research. It must 
be underscored here. Biomedical engineers are supposed to be, um, at the same time, in engineers and biomedical uh, scientists. These projects frequently demand intense collaboration among multiple labs. So again, concerns on poor reproducibility, on data integrity, and on methodological standards is naturally central to biomedical engineering and to the activities uh, activities here in the Yabiowski. Um, but the the stories the issue unfolds here. Uh, we uh, have problems that are not quite similar to those of uh, life science scientists, but they are related and their solutions can be shared, can help solve uh, each other's data problems. For example, we are especially concerned here with technologies involved in ubiquitous healthcare systems or platforms. Uh, they are platforms devised to provide a smooth, continuous, continuous data flow uh, um, among the complex net of components in the healthcare systems. These platforms require a gathering of urgent, urgent, simultaneous data from multiple sources, which feed decision-making process to and fro uh, multiple agents, and better, they must do it everywhere, all the time, for everyone. The development and maintenance of these platforms demands, first, uh, specially trained, skilled people that can perform transparent, transparent processes, and that can develop these technologies through intensive collaboration. So to build, operate and maintain high quality research data uh, or infra infrastructures or um, ecosystems. So again, it comes naturally that biomedical engineer centers and staff must be particularly uh, rigorous in collaborative research and data management. But uh, um, there, there is more. Biomedical engineers uh, are typically frontline in development and dissemination of new tools for analysis of li life science data. They include new uh, devices and analytical tools, both as software and hardware, and well, new analytical tools um, are emerging everywhere all the time. The most impressive of them are the machine learning algorithms, um, the use of machine learning algorithms uh, as analytical tools in life science uh, has grown tremendously within the past 10 years. They are quite welcome because they are able to cope with um, the amazing scale and complexity of biological data, like no other analytical tools to date. But uh, their misuse, uh, also like no other analytical tool, may be more threatening to transparency and reproducibility than the sadly ordinary misuses of the traditional statistical tools. They comprise a very complex paraphernalia of procedures and alternatives that are way more difficult to master and follow than, say, the calculation or meaning of p-values, effect size, and statistical power, or, and so on. Besides being harder to master, to understand, than simpler statistical models, the lack of transparency and illiteracy in machine learning process can hide biases in decision criteria on complex experimental data, perhaps, surely, increasing 
the irreproducibility of uh, data. To use these models in biomedical science, all these complex aspects of machine learning must be open, must follow uh, guidelines of reporting so we can trust them as transparent and reproducible. I think that biomedical engineers are in a key position to fight uh, data analysis illiteracy in general e and on machine learning methods in particular. Um, and uh, finally, um, as in on clinical research, um, say when searching for drugs potentially useful for human beings, most of biomedical engineering projects are justified by their high translational potential. What means that they intend to progress from the proto board to the approval um, of their projects by health control agencies. And finally, reach the health tech industry before being used by people. And like the drug-related non-clinical research, this path um, is paved by, by lesions of very expensive and sadly failed projects. They fail to reach people. To reach people. I recall a, a comment by Anton Bespalov, one of the founder members of PASP, stating that the uh, reproducibility crisis in biomedical science seems to have alarmed industry way more than the academic community. This commentary m m also made clear that rigorous standards of research in academy and in industry must match to, to foster productive um, collaborations among these people, among, among, uh, among biomedical engineers, public agents, and industry. That's why I think the next talks, not mine, but the next talks are vital, not only to life science, non-clinical researchers, but also to biomedical engineers. That's why we are here today. So let's start our journey by welcome Dr. Malcolm McLeod. McLeod, Dr. Malcolm McLeod from the University of Edinburgh and from the Camarades Research Group. Uh, I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Malcolm. Thank you very much for being us, with us today. Well, the floor is yours. Well, wow, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, for that introduction and for your introductory words. Can I just check that people can see my slides? Yeah, great. Thanks, Alavo. Uh, so I just wanted to kick us off with a quick review of, of uh, why it was that we thought, A, there was a problem, and B, it was a problem that was worth doing something about with a degree of urgency. So if you, uh, there's an old joke from uh, the 1970s when I was growing up, with apologies to any psychiatrists uh, on the call. Uh, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is only one, but the light bulb really has of the magnitude of the problem and, and, and therefore the impetus for change. As you will be aware, particularly those of you who work in academic settings, uh, initiatives which are supposed to assess and evaluate the quality of our research. And they use that to judge our case for promotions, uh, for appointment in the first place, uh, they use it to judge our institutions and how much money we should get. And often those evaluation exercises rest on things which are really outside our control, 
you know, how many Nobel Prize winners does an institution produce? How many papers in science or or nature or cell? But for me, that's just one part of what makes for academic excellence. Of course, there's the inspiration lying in the bath and thinking about displacement or sitting under a tree and having an apple fall on your head to to see for the first time the way that the world might be understood differently. That's inspiration. But there's also important bits around the design of, of, of projects. So how as researchers do we develop epistemological skills that allow us to say, if this is a hypothesis, how can we test that hypothesis uh, robustly and cheaply and effectively? And then there's the execution of the research, uh, how we actually do it. So in the project design, you know, having research designs which are at low risk of bias, which have got appropriate data management, which have involved an ethical reflection on what is proposed and I, I would hope have also been pre-registered. And then in the execution done with transparent reporting, appropriate analysis, appropriate evidentiary claims being made on the basis of the observations which were made, making materials available and disseminating your findings widely. And I think that while we can't do anything very much about the inspiration and the Nobel Prizes, apart from hoping that we get lucky in our recruitment, we can do something about our project designs and about the execution of those researches. I'm conscious that most of you are hearing this in a second language. We have second languages in, in the United Kingdom as well. In Scotland, we have Gaelic. In Welsh, they have Welsh. This is a road sign in Welsh where it says in English, no entry for heavy goods vehicles, residential site only. And then underneath it says the same thing in Welsh, in case there are some, I don't know, lorry drivers who, who uh, have got so far as driving a truck but, but can't read English. In fact, what this says is, I am not in the office at the moment, send any work to be translated. So this translational road signist, if you like, hasn't uh, understood their data management plan They've not understood what their data processing has done. They've just taken the the uh, uh, the data stream, the string that's come out of their process, and believed it to be true. And I think, as one of our difficulties is that as researchers, too many of us are inclined to believe things to be true without doing due diligence on how that conclusion was reached. This is one of my favourite experiments. Uh, involving functional MRI scanning. So functional MRI scanning is a technique which allows one to see areas of brain which are and which are activated in the context of particular cognitive tasks or, 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 or neural tasks. And they do so because that activity uh, gives greater metabolic activity, which can be detected in something called the blood oxygen level dependent signal. But they, these machines are temperamental and they need to be uh, uh, loved uh, uh, and, and petted and made to be just right before they can be used. And this group in Boston had a competition to see who could bring in the most unusual piece of organic material to put in the scanner to get it set up on the Monday morning. And one day it was Craig's turn. He was on his way to work when he realized he didn't have anything to put in the scanner. But fortunately, his route took him past the Boston fish market. He said, nobody's had a fish in the scanner before. It might make it smell for a day or two, but I'll win the prize. And the prize was free beer at the work barbecue. So that was a prize worth having. So he took the fish in, they got the scanner all set up and good to go. And then their healthy human volunteer didn't show up. And Craig's genius was to do the experiment on the salmon. So one mature Atlantic salmon participated in the fMRI study. It was 18 inches long, weighed 3.8 pounds. They didn't know what sex it was, but as, uh, as with most neuroscientists, they thought that probably wasn't very important. And the task administered to the salmon involved completing an open-ended mentalizing task. So it was shown a series of photographs of human subjects with a specified emotional valence. They were happy or sad or perplexed, and the salmon was asked to determine which emotion the human in the photograph was experiencing at the time. Several active voxels were detected within the salmon brain cavity with a cluster level significance of less than one in 1,000. So as they conclude, either we've stumbled onto a rather amazing discovery in terms of post-mortem ichthyological cognition, that is to say that dead salmon can think, or there's something wrong with the approach used. And of course, it's something wrong with the approach used. The multiplicity of different ways in which those images could be processed 
and the fact that they were processed in the light of the data which had already been collected meant that you could always find some signal in the middle of all that noise if you looked if you looked hard enough and they won the Ig Nobel Prize in neuroscience and rightly so to my own area of research this is where we're interested in developing drugs for stroke in animal models and what uh, one does is to include the middle cerebral artery on one side of the of the brain some of the animals get the uh, experimental treatment and some don't and after 72 hours you come back to see whether you can identify uh, to see whether you can identify a difference in the in the volume of brain that's been damaged and what you can see here in, in the, these rats is that uh, the control uh, group have an infarct volume of about 200 cubic millimeters reduced by 15 percent with half dose treatment and by 40 percent with full dose treatment so a very powerful treatment except this is low dose glutamate and homeopathic arnica and when i tell you that low dose that half dose is 10 to minus 120 molar and full dose is 10 to minus 60 molar. Then those of you who remember Avogadro's constant, 6 times 10 to 23, will appreciate that there isn't any drug in either of these conditions. And of course, if homeopathy was correct, this treatment at 10 to the minus 120 molar should be the more powerful, being the more dilute. So these findings don't fit with either our conventional belief systems about biology or indeed with homeopathy. So that something's wrong with this standard approach. We'd been interested 10 years ago now, in more than 10 years ago, in uh, identifying treatments which worked in animal models of stroke, which were likely safe in human subjects. And we reasoned that there must be some which were used in humans for other reasons, and we could repurpose them into stroke. So we started looking. We found over a thousand compounds tested in the laboratory in cells or in animals, of which 600 had been tested in animals, of which remarkably almost 400 improved outcome in those animal models. Of those, actually, 97 had already been tested in clinical trial, and in those clinical trials, one treatment, clot busting treatment with TPA, actually improved outcome in those clinical trials. And it was tested in human stroke, not because it works in animal models of stroke, although it does, and, and, uh, and we've shown that in systematic review meta-analysis, but because it works in the cognate human condition of myocardial infarction, where the vascular supply to a critical organ is occluded by thrombus. And against that, we have three treatments which we use in human stroke, uh, stroke unit care, aspirin, and decompressive hemicraniectomy, which hadn't been tested in animal models at all. So depending on how optimistic and generous we are feeling, the attrition rate is either 99.9% or 100%, but either way, it's not good, given the effort, the human effort, and the cost, and the animal cost that's gone into developing these data. So we've sought to address this problem with a, 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 an approach called systematic review and meta-analysis. And I just want to, using a different example, show you the bare bones of what you do. These is, this is from one of the early systematic review meta-analysis in the clinical space, 1988, from uh, the early breast cancer trialist collaborative group. And this is testing adjuvant tamoxifen uh, in early breast cancer. And essentially what they did is identified uh, all the different studies that they could find. And these studies are mostly quite small. Some of them are, are reasonably sized here, about... Uh, 1,600 per group here, uh, 1,600 altogether here, the same here. But individually, none of these studies uh, are showing a, a, a significant or a substantial benefit. The dot in the middle here is the point estimate from each of the studies, and the horizontal bar are the 95% confidence limits of that. This uh, uh, uninterrupted line here is the uh, line of no effect. So values across here show that treatment is better here, show that treatment is worse. And what you can see, while all of these studies individually are hinting at an effect, none of them are conclusively showing that there is a benefit. However, when you combine those results using meta-analysis, you can see that um, the overall, when combined, and this is the overall estimate of everything here involving 13,000 patients, uh, shows you a 20% improvement uh, in mortality uh, with a 95% confidence limits from 17% to 23%. So showing you 
um, with really a high degree of precision and, and confidence that this treatment is effective when you combine the results of different studies. So that's what we do. So what happens when we have that approach to stroke? This is a drug which was called NHY059, which was tested in a series of experiments in animal models of stroke prior to going on to be tested in human clinical trial, clinical trial program involving over 5,000 patients. Remarkably, uh, the belief at the time was that you could generate enough information to justify such trials on the basis of far, far fewer animals, 408 animals. Uh, and the clinical trials uh, program was neutral. The drug didn't do anything in clinical trials. And as a result, the uh, market of uh, AstraZeneca, the company involved, fell by 17% over 48 hours, $9.6 billion, took seven years to recover. When we look back at the animal, here's the overall estimate of the treatment effect, and it's 95% confidence limits. But when we look at those studies that reported taking measures to reduce the risks of bias in those experiments, you can see that studies which randomized, which blinded uh, the conduct of the experiment, which blinded the assessment of outcome, gave substantially and significantly smaller estimates of effect. And none of those studies did all three of these things. And the two studies that were used to encourage trial recruitment did none of those things. And so with the benefit of hindsight, it's easy to see why the, those studies failed. So we were told that clearly stroke researchers were stupid. We should look at other uh, clever neuroscientists. Let me just uh, show you that just now. Uh, I'm not going to show you that. We, we, we've looked at uh, similar experiments in models of experimental allergic encephalomyelitis, a model of multiple sclerosis, 6 hydroxy uh, dopamine unilateral striatal lesioning model of Parkinson's disease, and in models of Alzheimer's disease, and consistently see the same thing. This is Robert, Robert Rosenthal from 1963, looking at the effects. Uh, he was interested in behavioral outcomes in two cohorts of rats, maize bright animals, uh, which had been selected because they performed well in cognitive tasks, although they were uh, naive to this particular task and their duller country cousins who performed poorly. And the task's pretty straightforward. The rat's put in the stem of a tea maze. One arm is lit and the other is not. Uh, the unlit arm is reinforced with a food reward and which arm is which is flipped according to a predetermined random schedule. So the rats, rather like uh, our junior faculty, are, are being trained to turn to the dark side. And this is what the, the students found. And the maize bright animals started off performing better than the maize dull animals. And while the performance in both cohorts of animals improved over time, that performance was much more substantial in the maize bright animals and the difference between the groups diverged rather than got closer. Now, um, when he asked the students what they thought of their animals, the maize bright animals were rats with, with lovely wet noses and bright eyes, the sort of rat you'd like to take home to meet your mum and dad whereas the maize dull animals were surly and insolent, and three of the students were in fact bitten by, by the rats. And in fact, Rosenthal's not stupid. He hadn't done an experiment on the rats. He'd done an experiment on the students because there was no difference between the rats. They'd been selected from the same cages in the same animal house on the first day of the, the experiment. And the only difference between them in their observed cognitive performance and presumably also in their biting behaviors was in the expectations that the students had of how they would perform and how those expectations transferred to the animal behaviors. So I told you that we were told that stroke doctors were stupid. We were then told that neuroscientists were stupid. And so we just needed to look at proper research done by cancer biologists or infectious diseases doctors or HIV doctors. Then we'd see proper high quality research. So. We have a thing in the United Kingdom, which used to be called the Research Assessment Exercise, nice neutral name. It's been renamed now the Research Excellence Framework, a supreme piece of nominative determinism. You can guess that they're certainly going to find excellence wherever they look. They've been particularly impressed by uh, uh, neuroscience research in the UK. So we identified the five institutions which contributed most to animal research in uh, in their evaluations. And we got from PubMed 
a thousand publications, well, 1173 publications published by those five leading institutions in the two years following 2008, when they should have been at the head of the game. They're color coded to protect my future employment status, but this is a lovely Scottish color here. And you can see that randomization reported by about 15%, blinding by less than 20%, and it was excluded from analysis by about 10%, and power calculations by 2%. 68% of 1,173 publications did not one single one of those, and only one paper, one paper did all four. So remarkable uh, from what should be researchers at the top of their game. So many years ago with colleagues, including David Howells, uh, at that time at the University of Melbourne, and Nuri Dunagel and Emily Senna, who remains a, a close working colleague, we developed some guidelines for the reporting of stroke research, and then a few years later, someone came along to see whether that had made a difference. So this is in the journal Stroke. The ends men are up. And Mark Fisher was editor-in-chief of Stroke at the time. Uh, and he implemented these, these GLP guidelines on the reviewer platform. And here you can see improvement in the reporting of randomization. So this was published in 2009 in the reporting of randomization, in the reporting of allocation concealment, uh, blinding during the experiment, that is, in uh, in the reporting of blinded outcome assessment. So that's pretty good, seems to be moving a bit. There, as many of you will know, there are a set of guidelines for reporting animal research called the ARRIVE guidelines, endorsed by uh, over a thousand journals, but with a, a, an emerging um, uh, unfortunate truth that although the journals were adopting the guidelines, it didn't seem to be making very much difference to the quality of reporting. And we were told that they should just implement them properly. And if they implemented them properly, then everything would be would be brilliant. So we thought that was an interesting hypothesis. And again, with Emily Senna and Caitlin here, we did a randomized control trial at PLOS One, where manuscripts submitted to PLOS One were desk randomized to normal handling or to enhanced uh, compliance, where the authors were told that unless they submitted a completed arrived checklist, their manuscript would just sit on the sit on the, the desk of, of the of the in-house editorial team. And then once they'd been uh, randomized, they were sent out to identify an academic editor and then peer reviewers, and then some of them were accepted for publication and some not. And that whole process was conducted blind to there even being a study going on. So the office knew, but the academic editors didn't even know there was a study going on. And then for those that were published, uh, we got hold of the manuscript and we recruited a crowd of trained assessors to evaluate the publications against the arrived guidelines. You can see that the acceptance rates here were about the same in each of the groups. Uh, the checklist was completed by most people in the intervention group by 3% of the people where you asked nicely. So that's not going to work. Who knew asking scientists to do something without having a bit of a stick as well as a carrot. So what effect did it have on, on completion of the arrived checklist? None. Not a single paper in either group was compliant with the arrived guidelines. Uh, so simply telling people to do something doesn't really seem to make a difference. So as part of that, we and others, and Thomas, who you're going to hear from later, was involved in the development of new arrived guidelines, where one of the things that we've tried to do is to create some sense of prioritization so people are able to think and choose about where what might be the most important bit for them to uh, focus on as, for instance, as a journal. And there's a, an issue though that I think is, is more important and potentially more relevant to, to some on the call, which is that this has been focusing today largely on animal research. What's it like if we look in other biomedical research domains like in vitro research, cell culture based research? Well, in a study with Nature, looking at the reporting of randomization and blinding and the like in Nature journals before and after a change in their editorial policy, we matched those articles with uh, related citations using PubMed related citations in other non-Nature journals. But we also captured some in vitro research as part of that. So if you look at in vitro research at the reporting, I think I've got these highlighted, uh, of randomization, of blinding, of exclusion criteria, and of power calculations, 
nature before the change, nature after the change, non-nature before, non-nature after. This is much, much worse than we're seeing for, uh, for in vivo research, much, much worse. Uh, and I suspect that other areas uh, outside uh, clinical trials and animal research will similarly be much, much worse. Let me give you a further example from some recent work done with Timo Sander and colleagues in Dusseldorf looking at in vitro development of in vitro treatments for glioma. Now we selected, because we were trying to be kind, a single treatment with temozolomide, a well-established uh, treatment in clinical use for glioma, which has a marginal benefit on survival, using U87MG cells, which is one of the commonly used cell lines. And one of the cell lines, interestingly, where there is concerns about authentication in that the American T the, the ATCC, American Tissue Culture Collection version of the U87 cell line isn't the same as the original Uppsala version where they measured cell viability by colorimetric assay or by cell counting. There's lots of other ways we wanted to keep this simple. And in experiments where they used uh, Dolbeco's uh, modified Eagles medium, medium uh, which is what ATCC uh, recommend as the, as the preferred medium for this cell line. So what did we find? Well, randomization reported by not one out of 137, nor blinding, nor a power calculation. None of them had a study protocol available. Uh, lots of details missing that you would need if you were going to look at this in more detail. Cell line authentication. This is a cell line that's known to have problems, and 10% are authenticating their cell line. The passage tumor cell lines, and and normally you get a you get an Eppendorf from the liquid nitrogen, and you've got no idea what the passage number. And and for the first year, I was working with fibroblasts. It turned out, and um, so you've got to know the passage number to have any sense of what and only in 10% percentage number. And we know, we know as a biological fact that the response uh, to temozolomide in U87 cells is critically dependent on the concentration of glucose in the culture medium. And only 20% of papers actually report what the concentration of glucose is. So this is a real mess. And it's not doing a service to uh, humans with glioma, humans patients with glioma, it's not doing a service to clinical trialists who are interested in taking and testing treatments for glioma. It's not even doing a doing a service to the animals that we use in the next stage of this research if we develop treatments when we start testing in them in, in vivo models if it's based on such wonky preliminary data. Guidelines uh, which are, are trying to cover not just uh, cell culture, but all kinds of uh, uh, research in the life sciences, the materials design analysis reporting framework, uh, actually not in press anymore. It's now published in PNAS from earlier this year uh, and developed in collaboration uh, with uh, Nature and with PLOS and with AAAS and Science, Cell Press, Centre for Open Science, Wiley and eLife. So, so how do that's the problem how do we how do we try and fix it i think there's a big problem that we've got in that we don't we're not clear in our own minds what we think we're dealing with and i think that's because of a misuse or a misattribution of the phrase research integrity because i think when people talk about research integrity actually usually they mean researcher integrity so for me, researcher integrity is the professional and personal integrity with which a researcher goes about their work. Classically, it relates to issues of falsification and fabrication and plagiarism, but also it includes bullying and harassment and selfishness, discrimination and exploitation, particularly of early career researchers. Research integrity is different. It's the integrity or the provenance or, or the credibility of a research claim that will then go on to be used by researchers. And researchers are different. So yes, you've got falsification and fabrication and plagiarism at one end of the spectrum, but then you've got things which are which are less deliberate, uh, which are less culpable, which are easier to understand. For instance, hypothesizing after results are known or doing experiments at risk of bias. And then things which are better, like, like conducting science in an open way, pre-registering your studies. And our problem is that we've previously concentrated on focusing on these people here who are breaking the rules. And that means that when my research integrity office calls, I think they've got nothing to do with me. I don't go to their programs or the seminars because it's for someone else. It's about people who invent things and that's not me. So it's got nothing to do with me. 
Uh, so instead, could we not have a research improvement strategy, which instead of trying to get rid of, of, of the most extremely bad behaviors, just try to make everyone a little better? Because everyone could do it. I could, I, you know, I've got lots of room for improvement. Uh, and if I could just get a little bit better every day, every week, every year, then en masse and in aggregate, it would have a major effect. So this research improvement rather than accountability should, should focus on research systems, not on individuals. It should recognize that we're all fallible. It should, it should emphasize the importance and the benefits of teamwork, value local peer review. And when we see something wrong, we should welcome that because it, we've found a way to make things better. It's not like we should just hide away all the things that we, that we, that, that, that we do wrong because we don't want to talk about them. We should see them as opportunities. So here are some examples for this around uh, open science audit for improvement. These are published works from the uh, Stroke Research Group uh, at the University of, no, this is actually, this is the University of Edinburgh in total. DOIs for published works from Crossref and then getting the open access status from on paywall and looking at the change in number of publications here uh, and their status for whether they're closed or bronze or hybrid or green open or gold open access status. So in, uh, in 2021, 64% of, uh, of publications were open access. And this is showing the proportion that are open. And you can see that we are hitting high points of around about 80% in 2018. Some of this delay is because uh, some of this decline is because there's a, often a delay in things being available openly. So this is immediately open and this is open after three or four years. And I should uh, acknowledge Nico Riedel at the charity in Berlin, Quest Center Berlin, who's been working on developing these tools for institutional uh, uh, dashboards of research performance. So here's individual researchers. So, and this individual researcher is me. I published perhaps too much. Uh, this isn't my birth certificate. It's a very early case report when I was a junior neurologist. And you can see that, I, you know, as, as with most careers, I've, I've published more uh, over time. Uh, and this is my open access status. And I'm, I'm doing slightly better than the Edinburgh University average in terms of my work being, my work being open. So that's a useful thing that we can track and see. This is looking at, back to animal research. This is University of Edinburgh. Uh, looking at the reporting of blinding in animal research, looking at the reporting of randomization in, in animal research. And you can see that we've gone from a low of about, uh, this is when I was appointed to my chair. So I would like to think that some of this changes because I've been uh, banging on about this all the time. So now perhaps 50% of our animal research reports randomization. That's better than it was. What's more important is that we're improving, not what's happening. This is looking at funding agencies. This is... Uh, just the, the unweighted average of the reporting of randomization and of blinding by funding agency for the years 2011 to 18, preliminary data from text mining rather than uh, natural language processing, which is where we are just now. Black is the overall average, uh, overall performance. Teal are various different NIH uh, agencies. Uh, gray are others. And this is NINDS, which has done so much uh, to promote uh, uh, improvement in reporting in the neurosciences, at least. I said that improvement was more important than the absolute level of, uh, uh, of performance. And I really do believe that. So here's the average performance over uh, the entirety of that of that eight year period. Uh, but here's the improvement. And you can see NINDS here has good, good performance, but it's also improving a lot over the period. And here are some of the UK funders where our performance is below average, actually, for UK funded work. But our improvement and our rate of improvement is among uh, uh, the highest of, of those funders that we've observed. And of course, if you can do for that for funders, you can do it for institutions. So here are UK institutions uh, over the same period. Uh, the uh, crosshairs here are the median performance. So this is the median rate of improvement. This is the median overall performance and you can see that some institutions are up in this sweet spot again where they're both improving quite rapidly and their performance is quite good this is edinburgh sitting on the equator here trying to pretend to be a planet uh, uh, with rings around it but you can look at a uh, you can look at different performances and it gives you league tables which are slightly different from the ones that you would normally 
that you would normally consider. So the best performing institution is the University of Nottingham and the fastest improving is the University of Aberdeen. Those are slightly atypical from our usual league tables. And if you look individually at blinding and at randomization, you can see that the absolute performance and the, and the rates of improvement have Oxford and Cambridge and UCL not widely represented in these league tables. So it gives a different perspective, going back to my three-legged stool of the quality of work that's done. And from the UK Reproducibility Network, the idea that this should be something that's driven by us as researchers, not externally imposed. So we assert what, what constitutes best practice. And we do that on the basis of reporting guidelines or research on research or expert opinion or the views of research users. And we measure our performance and then we try to improve it. And then we measure it again and we review our performance and celebrate success and raise our ambitions and go through this, continue to go through this cycle. So I'm sorry if I've gone on a little long, but I wanted to get through all of that. Uh, I'd like to thank Equip and everyone that's worked with us over the year, my colleagues, over the years, my colleagues, uh, David Howells here uh, from Australia, uh, Nadia, this is Nico Rido who did the dashboard. Here's Uri Donago, Emily Sena, Andrew Rice from Equipped, Kim Weaver from Equipped. There's other Equipped folks about here as well. But thank you very much for your time and have to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. McLeod. Fantastic talk. Thank you very much. You, you get the, I, I, I came out of this with the exact balance between alarmed and hopeful. Thank you very much. <laughs> So, um, we finished it just in time. We have one minute left, minute left uh, uh, until the next talk. So, um, I, I'm, I'm get some difficulty. Please, Olavo. Olavo. Uh, can, I, can I have a question? Oh, please. Yeah, so Malcolm, uh, last slide was nice. I mean, uh, I, I agree that the community should, should set standards, but the community is large and heterogeneous. And uh, I, I think in principle, the UKRN uh, idea looks nice, but like how do we resolve uh, different people thinking different things about what uh, excellence means? Uh, I mean, who's, uh, it, 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 it seems like a hard hard thing to manage democratically. So how, how you at the UKRN are, are, are looking at this? So the, the, the I think it's critically important that there's buy into what the criteria are. In some communities, there have been community wide uh, approaches to trying to assert what quality is. So there's been Delphi processes and, uh, and the like where the, to try and build that consensus. And where those exist, you, you, you can use that. Where they don't exist, it might be interesting to try and build some, build some consensus about what they are. And the other thing that you can do is you can do uh, systematic reviews of guidelines that people have put out. So we've done a systematic review of guidelines for the conduct of animal research as part of EQUIP, which I think was, was really quite interesting in the range of different dimensions, some of which we'd not really thought about. And then that at least gives you a rationale for saying, this isn't our list of things. This is, this is you know, we've used the provenance of, 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 of of uh, the, the, these quality items. The other thing, though, that I think that's really interesting is that the debate and discussion around what should be on your quality list is itself informative and, and will help a community move forward in reflecting on what it's trying to do and, and what it could do better. And of course, that can be informed by systematic review meta-analysis showing that some of the things that you think might be reported haven't been reported or even that experiments with a particular characteristic tend to give higher or lower estimates of effect than those that don't have those estimates. So for instance, in the move into in vitro research and what's quality issues for in vitro research, clearly some of the things like randomization and blinding will be in play. But I think, you know, there's other things like, you know, glucose in my cell culture medium or passage number or pseudo replication or cell line authentication, which are just not an issue in in vivo research but may be critically important in in vitro research. So it's really important not just to take one framework and blindly apply it in different domains. I think you, I think you need to be really careful about thinking through and building support for what your framework is. And even if you can't build support for everything on the list, 
to try and get the community to agree what the two or three things that most urgently need fixed are, and then to start at work at those. But this is, you know, Olava, you and I are going to be long retired. Our grandchildren will be retired before this is uh, before this is fixed. And I don't have any grandchildren yet. It's okay. Thank you very much for for the talk. So let's go ahead, and I'd like to. Uh, well, Sorry, uh, uh, Marino. Please, please, there, please. Also, there's another question in the um, in the chat. Please, please. Um, so, do you think the application of Newcomb Benford law could be useful to identify problems? That was asked there, but I don't even know what the Newcomb Benford law is. Um, have you heard of it? Anybody in the group? It's for it's for Malcolm. This, this. I think it's for Malcolm. Yeah. Yeah. So let me yeah. just uh, let me just new how do you spell it? Newcomb Belford Law. What is it? Yeah, Newcomb Benford. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yes, yeah, so so there is some good stuff that's done around about this. Uh, so this is this is uh, inappropriate numbers. So it's the Grim tool that James Heather's and Nick Brown have identified. Uh, which has actually led to some uh, recent uh, 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 stuff. including around some of the ivermectin studies where the where the numbers that were presented in the papers were implausible. So he's he's got the, they, they've got that tool which can be useful, particularly if you've got and we've seen it sometimes in our animal studies when they. It's easier to see uh, impossible numbers when the group size is very sl small. So if you've got three animals in an interval scale, some uh, values are impossible. So must be wrong. Uh, so you can use it for that. The other thing that's useful in the psychology literature in particular is Michelle Newton's uh, tool where she is able to crawl through publications uh, that use the American Psychological Association style guide for reporting ANABAS and, and uh, F statistics and, and, and work out whether the P value that's presented is consistent with the F value which is given. And that's also a way to, to trap a whole load of things. And then the other way that, that's another variation of the, I think I would put in the, the variation of the same law, is uh, all logo sequences. So there's a, there's a rich literature which suggests that some people deliberately give the wrong oligo sequences in their work to hold up their 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 competitors. So, so someone's used an oligonucleotide, you go to the paper, you take the sequence, you order it from Amgen or whomever, and when it arrives, it doesn't work. And it turns out that it's because they gave the wrong sequence. So can you take the, the, the oligo sequence, extract it from the paper using text mining, and then blast it against the database to see whether it's real or not? And that also shows substantial difficulties with 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 uh, with reporting. So yes, I think I think there's lots of different approaches that could be used. Um, but you know, I've got papers where I've got uh, there's errors in in my papers, and and they're usually they're transcription errors where a digit has been carried across poorly. You know, in the days before I used Excel uh, before I used R from Excel to a Word document to reformatting a table to then uploading it as a PDF and a number a number's gone wrong and it's how you can best separate uh, that kind of uh, well-intentioned clumsiness from deliberately making stuff up and I think that is difficult and I would always assume just because there's so much uh, so ne never never attribute to evil what is better explained by carelessness and uh, so i would always start by assuming that that people were trying their best uh, before accusing them of making stuff up that's nice well uh before introducing renza honkarachi uh well i'd like to welcome also thomas steckler is now with us welcome hi thomas well, now let's let's go uh, and introduce, or not introduce, but offer the floor to Renza Bronkarat from PASP. Thank you very much for being with us, Renza. It's yours. Thank, thank you, uh, Marino. Uh, so I will try now to share my screen. I think you should be uh, able to see. Uh, 
That's okay. That's okay. So, so fine. fine. So, so uh, I, I spend, spend the next uh, 20, 20, uh, 20, 20, 30, 30 minutes, minutes uh, talking, talking about, about rigor, rigor in collaborative research, research and, and you, you have already, already got, got uh, uh, a glance, glance after, after this, this uh, nice, nice uh, introductory talk, talk about, about, about why rigor, rigor in collaborative research, research is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is important, important but, but just, just before going, going to this is I, I able, able yes, yes, to move uh, my, my slides. slides. So, so let, let me just, just spend, spend uh, a few few minutes uh, talking a little bit about uh, the importance of scientific uh, collaboration. So nowadays uh, we know that uh, modern research has become more uh, more complex. Uh, you have already named it. Uh, base, uh, we have. Uh, much uh, uh, complex uh, technologies, uh, the use uh, of machine learning, or artificial intelligence, big data, uh, and already uh, 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 omics, uh, omics data. So these, all these development have, have made uh, the uh, a rise in, 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 in the scale and importance of scientific collaboration. It's clear why, because with collaboration, you will get uh, uh, greater creativity, more experience, uh, higher number of available techniques, uh, and the possibility to carry out uh, deeper research, uh, test, novel appro approaches, new technologies. Uh, and uh, so if we think uh, about uh, collaboration, as I was saying, this has grown in scale as it is uh, depicted in the, in the picture on the bottom, bottom right. Uh, indicating a network uh, of collaborations uh, leading to the discovery of one, uh, uh, one I don't know, compound, but is not, uh, not really important for the discussion. And as you know, uh, a researcher will, will, will collaborate in different ways uh, in, with, in, within uh, the same institution, so in-house, and uh, there, will, there are academic um, uh, collaboration with uh, uh, non-academic uh, uh, institution, and I will spend some time uh, uh, to speak about uh, academic collaboration with the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and also, uh, I will touch uh, on uh, an important uh, type of collaboration, which is the service provided uh, by, by core facilities uh, to, uh, to laboratory in, in in house in the same institution or uh, uh, other or also provided to other institutions and of course international uh, collaboration so uh, since i've mentioned i will spend some time uh, speaking about uh, the importance of academia industry uh, collabor collaboration uh, so why um, industry uh, uh, collaboration has been uh, has become important for uh, for industry. Uh, we we know that uh, in the pharmaceutical industry has been uh, face, uh, facing uh, the lack of uh, development of new um, of new efficacious uh, med medicine, uh, long uh, long standing uh, known uh, issue. Uh, and so, and the, the increasing complexity of the R&D process has brought about uh, the need of, uh, of collaboration that can ha happen in different models. Uh, I, don't wo I, I don't go into, into the details of this, but as I was mentioning, I will uh, specifically talk about pharma uh, and academic collaborations that can happen in different, uh, in different models. So if we look at the typical uh, drug uh, discovery pipeline, so moving from uh, the left-hand side uh, to the right, uh, the right side, this is made uh, starting with, uh, from basic research, uh, and then target identification, target validation, uh, drug, uh, uh, drug discovery. And if we look at the core strength is clearly uh, the higher strength uh, of uh, pharmaceutical industry is on the right path, being drug discovery and drug development, uh, while the core strength of academia are on the left-hand side, uh, being um, disease expertise, pathway knowledge, uh, and uh, some specific 
technology technology platform. So if uh, we think what is uh, uh, the benefits uh, uh, of industry, pharmaceutical industry collaborating with uh, academia, this is mainly uh, knowledge uh, because uh, the pharmaceutical industry will profit from uh, highly qualified uh, academic researchers or students and gain access to technology and research infrastructure, and by this uh, uh, potentially lower R&D costs and, um, and obtain a faster discovery and development of new, of new medicines. So if we look at the other sides of this uh, uh, public um, uh, private uh, partnership. So, what is uh, uh, academia mainly interested uh, interested to? Whether it is um, uh, actually a, a collaboration with pharma or collaboration in general. So, as it has been shown by this publication for from 2015, what is most important for uh, for academia is what you find in the picture on the. Uh, on the first three three columns, so it is uh, obtaining compounds, funding, and publishing. Whether it's not so much important to have involvement in drug development or external scientific uh, scientific inputs. So, if we uh, consider the uh, funding, uh, for instance, uh, it uh, can be recognized. Uh, that, uh, for instance, collaboration with industry has become a considerable part of academia funding uh, nowadays. Uh, and in general, uh, it is easier uh, to get funding in the context of a collaboration. Uh, and many funders uh, support or even require partnerships uh, between countries. This is quite uh, typical in Europe, where the European Commission has established a mechanism to support partnerships uh, within uh, countries. And these can, uh, uh, can happen in different, uh, in different uh, models, uh, like, uh, for instance, uh, teaming uh, between two collaborators or twinning with minimum three, three collaborators, uh, um, and in this case, uh, trying to foster uh, the, uh, and to increase uh, innovation performance uh, in area where the research is uh, uh, slightly is underdeveloped. Uh, and um, the European Commission is also um, fostering uh, an innovation, the, this innovation medicine initiative, which uh, actually is uh, represent uh, the uh, largest uh, biomedical uh, public-private partnership in, in the world, uh, where uh, a consortium of academic institutions is partnering with uh, uh, the European Federation of Pharma Industry. And actually, this, uh, the e equipped uh, project was uh, actually one of these innovative medicine initiative uh, projects. So uh, the other benefit that I was mentioning that academia has uh, in uh, uh, having uh, collaboration is publishing. Um, in fact, uh, if, we, if one look at the citation counts, uh, these increase with collaboration from a single institution uh, uh, in, uh, to increasing uh, the number of countries that, uh, that collaborate. So, and since we, uh, we are in these uh, times of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, I was interest to, interested to see whether uh, the pandemic had any effects uh, in collaboration. And so what I found is that uh, it seems that uh, the pandemic brought uh, about a greater connectivity and blurred geographical boundaries and a uh, and had an um, um, increase in a, in a form of hyper-collaboration, hyper which means that what is mostly important to achieve uh, or to develop innovative uh, products uh, or uh, um, discoveries is not uh, a single uh, uh, company or a single uh, 
research group, but what is important is really to be part of an innovation ecosystem as it has happened for the partnership for the manufacturing of the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Uh, and some characteristics of uh, this uh, new, uh, of this not, not really, not really new uh, situation is to have uh, a more open mindset, op more open mindset to share knowledge, data and information, uh, a pre-competitive information sharing, the use of preprint uh, servers to share findings in real time, uh, for review uh, by a board of community of peers, and some journals have been also required submissions uh, on a preprint uh, server first. So this sounds uh, quite uh, quite good. However, uh, this trend uh, has not been without uh, controversy, also generating um, uh, issue when uh, premature work uh, maybe got into into the public. And this has the challenge to uh, that may, may elevate premature or lower quality uh, of work. So that why is, that, that's why open access platforms recognize the need for more rigor and standards. So then we we are coming to this uh, uh, important concept of rigor uh, again. Uh, so just to summarize this, uh, we have seen that collaboration, uh, scientific collaboration has uh, many benefits, uh, that collaborations increase chances of being successful, but there are uh, challenges. And to reinforce this, uh, for instance, what if uh, uh, one starts a collaboration with someone that uh, uh, you don't know, or if you don't speak the same the same language as your partner and have different, particularly different quality expectations. Um, uh, we know that uh, uh, understanding of terms uh, uh, like, for instance, randomization uh, can be different between uh, partners. Uh, and for another example is what if you receive broken or missing traceability and metadata are not clearly, clearly reported. So what we think uh, at, uh, at PASP is that, uh, as we have already heard uh, today, that transparency, defining and understanding the terminology and to align on good research practice is uh, essential. And this uh, will also uh, build uh, trust, which is necessary for, uh, for a su successful uh, collaboration. And uh, how in order to, uh, how it is possible, is, how is possible to achieve this one uh, uh, mean to improve in, on, on this and to achieve these, these goals uh, is provided by the KIPT, uh, which is uh, a framework uh, which uh, support, uh, uh, can support research and collaboration by providing recommendations regarding various aspects of uh, research rigor and not only for, uh, uh, for collaborations, of course, uh, but in the context of collaboration, this will facilitate decision making uh, regarding uh, the selection of research partners and will increase the confidence in data uh, delivered by, by collaborations. And uh, I will, would like then to um, quickly explain two, uh, two, ex uh, two examples or two types of guidance. One is for the industry academia collaboration and the second one, as I mentioned before, uh, in uh, an academia academia uh, service uh, provided from uh, from core core facilities. So uh, regarding the first situation, so guidance on industry academia col collaboration uh, within the equip uh, project, a joint uh, effort as um, has been uh, has been done uh, to uh, facilitate uh, decision de decision making 
uh, to minimize bias and errors in the collection, reporting and representation of the data, uh, to improve the data storage, traceability and integrity, and finally create reliable scientific and supporting evidence for different types of research outputs. And these uh, uh, recommendations are uh, collected in uh, in such uh, in such a docu document and tools containing these uh, uh, six uh, six sections uh, that cover uh, the most important aspects and and recommendation indicated ab above and in which and that Malcolm has already touch uh, touch into. So the, the other type of collaboration I wanted to uh, briefly uh, talk about uh, is uh, uh, about uh, the service provided by core facilities. And before going to that, I would just I would like just to spend a few words on uh, on core facilities because uh, uh, core facilities have gained uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 years uh, increasing uh, importance and a central position in many areas of research uh, in life sciences. In fact, uh, core facilities provide access to state-of-the-art equipment uh, and advanced skills. Uh, they developed new technologies uh, and very importantly, uh, core facilities generate a, a substantial fraction of the scientific data thereby uh, they offer really an important entry point uh, to protect against bias in the design and analysis of experiment, supporting uh, the trans transparency, rigor and reproducibility. So similarly, a working group uh, draft, uh, from part of Equip, Equip has drafted a memorandum of understanding and the document uh, is uh, presented in, in the right uh, part of the slides. So this document uh, summarizes expectations for best practices in research supported by academic or facilities and also proposed uh, models to different modules for a regular service and an, an equipped service. Um, uh, dependent, uh, in, de dependent from uh, uh, different different needs, uh, and again uh, there are uh, recommendation and expectation uh, regarding uh, training. Uh, this is particularly interesting uh, for core facility and uh, an important aspect. Uh, because uh, it is important that core facility will train uh, the users uh, of the core facility and only after training uh, the people will get uh, uh, access to core facility uh, and to the core facility and another important aspect is on data storage and traceability and here uh, particularly important will be that uh, early on it is clarified where the data are stored, whether they are stored in the core facility or in the user uh, laboratory. And finally, on this topic, I would like to mention that uh, this memorandum of understanding has been distributed to a number of core facilities re uh, requesting uh, feedback about uh, this memorandum of understanding. Uh, and so the one results of the survey is uh, represented here where um, uh, of the 172 core facility that uh, responded to the survey, uh, 62 and 34 agreed or strongly agreed with uh, uh, the statement here that the presented recommendations increase uh, data, data quality. So uh, finally, I would like to just mention another couple of tools uh, that we think uh, might be uh, very useful uh, to use in, uh, uh, in scientific collaboration. One is the tool for funders. Um, uh, this has also been developed in collaboration with, uh, with the Equipped Working Group. 
and this is designed primarily primarily to be used by to help scientists to identify potential gaps uh, in their practices and from this uh, tool they can create a snapshot to demonstrate to funders that they are aware and they've implemented uh, quality measures Example of the questions are uh, uh, depicted as uh, the screen. You can see in the uh, screenshots of these slides. So the questionnaire is relatively simple. It can be completed in 20 minutes. It is free for anyone to use and available uh, online. So finally, uh, I would like also to mention uh, quality modules that we have developed for grant uh, applications. Uh, these um, uh, modules are, can be customized, uh, but in general what is proposed is to have these uh, different models which uh, contains an initial assessment uh, of the research rig uh, rigor in, in, the, in, the lab in the laboratory uh, or institutions that uh, uh, participate in the grant application where they will then ge uh, get general general training, then part of uh, the module that can be part uh, uh, of the of grant application will be during the course of the, the projects when it is granted to have spot checks, uh, data quali con quality control of the data and eventually an equipped implementation and, uh, and, cer and certification of, uh, the, the quality, of the quality system. Um, and this should, uh, should uh, uh, help on one side to, uh, to get funding, uh, on the other side uh, will allow uh, um, the, the researcher to get uh, accreditation and certification of uh, of the quality and, and, and rigor. So with this, uh, I have concluded and we, I would like just leave the audience with uh, some some questions if uh, 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 because it will be interested also for us to get uh, feedback. And so these are uh, some some of possible uh, question that someone might uh, might like to to answer and give us uh, feedback. Uh, like if you have experience with collaborative research, if uh, there is a push uh, in Brazil, for instance, for collaboration, as we have we see in uh, in Europe, what kind of ex uh, experience uh, do you do you have? Do you have any um, recommendation? Uh, and finally, also since I was touching in on preprints, uh, whether how do you feel about uh, about preprints? And so with this, I have concluded and I will be also happy to get uh, what questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Henza, for this very nice talk. It's, I think it's so complex to build a, a social <laughs> um, compromise, a social... Um, mode of operating in a, in a, in a profession so full of egos <laughs> that this, this <laughs> is uh, nearly a psychiatric problem uh, to, to, to solve with these guidelines and, and kind of laws. Thank you very much. It's the very dimension of our problems. So we, we are we have now five minutes uh, to the next presentation, so we have time for questions or time for uh, before Dr. Bjorn Gerlach uh, presents. Does anyone have any questions in the in the board here? Uh, if I can throw, uh, if I can get to Malcolm's first slide, like uh, uh, the loud bulb mode must want to be changed. So how do you convince the community that they, I mean, accreditation, something like equipped accreditation and license, that's, I mean, nobody really likes being auditing. So, I mean, do you think the push should come from funders, from institutions? Do you think the community might actually 
do this voluntarily. Uh, this is something. I mean, I I I, I super uh, believe in 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 the need for this kind of accreditation. But like, who who convince scientists that they actually need this? Um, Hands on. So, well, they asked the question for 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 me. I, I wasn't sure because you were mentioning. I thought you were mentioning Malcolm. Sorry. No, no. I, I, I was just getting back to Malcolm's first slide that the light bulb must uh, need must want to be changed for it to change. Yeah. So, like, uh, I, I, so I, the, the 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 scientists must want to. And so, yeah. how, how do you convince them? To, to go through the but but it's for you yeah yeah I, I mean yeah I'm I think I'm uh, I agree with you that is not so easy and I'm I'm facing this uh, this difficulty even if uh, many uh, many people I talk to they recognize that there is uh, the need for more uh, more rigor and they at least on the first place get interested in uh, what uh, what in equipped and the past and what what we are doing. But uh, uh, still, is um, uh, I, I really, really need, think it's a, it's a cultural change is necessary. And as Malcolm was saying, this will will take, uh, unfortunately, will take uh, will take time. So we are trying to motivate. I would think, uh, I would uh, start to, I will try to to make people see the the advantage because for me actually these rules uh, or these recommendation are really not to to make an assessment or to say you are good or bad for, i see this really as a as a it should should be uh, i i see it at least as a facilitation because if you if you get uh, if one gets these measures and uh, planning help in in planning. This will facilitate uh, the research and at the end uh, uh, get better results faster. So I'm I'm really convinced this, but uh, I'm not probably still not able to convince <laughs> to really convince others. <laughs> um, I I would like to add here because it's a very interesting and important question. Um, all our um, so from experience in the field, we hear both so that some really say, oh, no, I, I really I don't want to let anybody in my research lab because, yeah, I don't want anyone to look at, at what I'm doing and look at my fingers, how I do it. But on the other hand, we also have um, some research labs that actually say, hey, that's actually an opportunity for me. I know I'm doing good research. I have established certain processes and I want to have that approved by somebody else, by a third party. So um, from the labs we are working with currently, we, we heard actually, yeah, kind of these, these quite opposite and these both sides. So it's, it's very interesting. So how many labs do you work with currently? Uh um, I can't, can't really say a, a, a real number because um, so there are currently four certified labs and we have 10 to 20 from academia we are working with, um, but then there are also biotech companies. So, yeah, yeah. So I uh, can't, can't give you ex a precise number, but I guess, yeah. Yeah, and there's actually another um, question in the in the chat um, from. Um, I'm I'm sorry. I, I guess I need uh, some native speaker to pronounce it correctly. Oh, from... Okay, João Marcolin. Thanks, <laughs> Marino. <laughs> so he's asking Renza, do you think that most of the challenges founded in open research are actually challenges of the closed? research that are hidden or decent looked um i'm i'm unsure whether i really understood the question mm -hmm. i i'm not sure too so but the, the first of he's trying to to put the conflict of the usual traditional ways of doing research how how the I think the the interest is the, the in this 
way of doing research conflict with the effort to do a more open research. Uh, uh, there is resistances. Um, uh, what are the other sources of resistance to doing um, uh, open science and collaborative, open, transparent science, yeah, in your opinion? You, one thing is, uh, I would say, intellectual properties, but not in the sense uh, uh, that for as a pharmaceutical industry you are protecting compounds but you protect your knowledge and so your your advantage because I also in my scientific career I have experienced uh, that uh, uh, some researcher was saying yeah but I won't collaborate with them or I won't share my my knowledge because I want to publish first and so I think uh, this is one one thing that this uh, pressure to, to publish is, uh, uh, is really a hindrance uh, to, to open to more open science uh, and, to, and to collaboration. And I personally believe that the metrics uh, to quantify uh, the value of, uh, of research should, should change from, uh, from the impact, uh, impact factor. Mm -hmm. This is my very, <laughs> I'm convinced this, but yes, very my, my personal <laughs> Uh, it's so the, I don't the, know if this answers the question, but uh, <laughs> I think that is. This is a matter of not only enforcing but changing the the, the ways we enforce behaviors. Mm. Um, we are enforced in the academy. The, we are uh, granted by certain behaviors that threaten transparency, threaten the adoption of these procedures. This is a, is a, must be a, a new social, big uh, deal mm. um, in the forms we um, give reinforcement to certain behaviors, enforce certain behaviors in academy and and people, but it, that's it. So, Renza, I think uh, that's it. Renza, thank you Hi. very much. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic workshops so far. <laughs> and we uh, pass, pass the microphone. So, we'll that to. Bjorn Gerlach, Bjorn Gerlach, Dr. Bjorn, the floor is yours. So I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? It's it's okay. We can see. Okay, perfect. It's okay. So yeah, thanks. Um, hello again from my side to all of you on your screens. Um, and thank you very much, Marino and Flavio, for organizing this meeting, for the technical bits and so so um, we will now focus on data integrity and data management. Uh, let's start with data integrity and what it means, because to me it was always a very abstract term until actually I heard a presentation by Thomas, who will speak after our little break several years ago. So he asked the question about the reproducibility of experiments. and. Um, I think they illustrate very well the meaning of data integrity, since these are very practical and concrete examples for your daily lab life. Um, so this first question to think about is, can you repeat the experiment that you did two years ago? So if you think about your data records and your lab notebook entries from two years ago, what do they look like? Will you be able to repeat the experiment with the knowledge you have and based on these notes? And of course, I hope so. But in many cases, also from my own experiments when I started as a researcher, uh, it will certainly be uh, difficult. And then the next question brings in another dimension. 
can you repeat the experiments from your colleagues that were done two years ago? And from my experience, this will even be harder since you have this lack of the personal knowledge about the experiment and the way they were performed. So this creates already um, another barrier for repeating the experiment. But then also the next question kind of always gives me um, hope um, because it's can you repeat the experiment you do today in two years again? So will you be able to put in the measures that are really needed? And that will be the focus in the next minutes to create awareness and provide examples about what needs to be considered to ensure this data integrity, that it can be repeated again. And then hopefully all these questions indeed can be answered with a yes. So first, I would like to create some awareness about two definitions. This is first data integrity. And data integrity can be defined as the degree to which data are complete, consistent, accurate, trustworthy, and reliable. And additionally, these characteristics do not only apply for the moment of data generation, but also throughout the entire life cycle of the data. That is, that is very crucial because time plays an important role, as we just described on the slide before. So data need to have the same value in 2, 10 or 15 years from now. And to assure that, this is the second definition here, um, a good documentation practice should be established. And good documentation practice can be described as the methods for creating and maintaining data records. This includes already recording of the data, as well as the correcting and managing them. So it's all about ensuring the reliability and integrity of this information. And um, throughout all aspects of the data life cycle. So therefore, our main goal is, besides creating high quality research data and publishing them, to ensure, um, sorry, I'm just, yes. So, so to also ensure the integrity um, of the data by um, best documentation practice. So um, here is one more definition we have to go into, and that is the one of raw data. So what is actually raw data? What do we understand as it? As raw data, we consider all original records and documentation, which are the result of an observation and activities in the study. And this may include photographs, videotapes, plots, chromatograms, computer readable media, dictated observations, and much more. But it also includes data that are directly entered into a computer throughout an automatic instrument or interface, like from a plate reader. And as the last bullet here states, it also includes copies of original laboratory records and documentation that are complete and of good quality. But the definition is even a bit wider since it also may include processed results of the original observation that cannot be stored for some technical reasons. And these technical reasons could be cases when data sets are recorded in a format that may not be readable at a later time point. Or when exceptionally large volumes of data are generated that are technically difficult to store without pre-processing to reduce the storage volumes. 
So this might be the case for videotapes or video recordings where the volume is, is really, really big. So in these cases, it could well be that also the CSV files containing, containing data from these videos um, so that these uh, videos would be um, considered as the raw data records. So um, I want to give you now an example where this data integrity was actually not given. And there are many, um, but for this case here, I, put, I picked one now, one from GlaxoSmithKline, where the R&D boss actually was fired in the end, and the first author of the paper resigned the job. So what happened here? So someday, an anonymous email pointed towards some issues in a nature medicine paper published by employees of the company. And this article was on the involvement of interleukin-7 in multiple sclerosis. And based on this email, GSK then started an investigation. And it actually showed that some of the data were indeed misrepresented. So um, the investigator found that blood samples, which were claimed to be from MS patients, actually came from healthy donors over of unknown origin. Therefore, the data were not accurate and did not represent what they actually should have represented. So the data integrity was broken here. And as we see here, it had bad consequences. So the, the company, but even more the researchers, needed to establish, I'm very sorry, um, it's somehow jumping um, here. The researchers needed to reestablish their the trust and integrity um, in their research. Or as the famous investor from the US put it, Warren Buffett, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. So if you think about that, you will do things differently. And I believe that adhering to data integrity practices will certainly help to build such a reputation but even more importantly, it, would, it will help to prevent losing it. So what are now these data integrity practices? There are two principles which I think make sense to remember and which are important here. And these principles are Alcoa Plus and FAIR. Whereas Alcoa is the acronym for attributable, legible, contemporaneous, original, and accurate. And FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. It is very difficult to clearly uh, distinguish them or describe a focus. But in general, one could say that Alcoa focuses with its attributes on the experiment and the description of the data. And for FAIR, the focus is a bit more beyond the experiment and the data itself, and has a strong em stronger emphasis on the metadata. So basically the data describing the data. And um, FAIR is then more also for in the context of published data. Um, So just a few words to the origin. The principles of Alcoa, but not yet the acronym, was first mentioned by the FDA um, in 1968. So it's quite an, an old concept and um, yeah, probably much older um, than, than some of us. Um, and over the years, it was modified in the 90, it was modified to the Alcoa Plus principles. So these four additional items, complete, consistent, enduring, and available were added to them. And there is actually a nice story by Stan Wuhlen, an FDA office um, officer, who came up actually with this acronym Alcoa on one of the car rides to a meeting. Um, and I was thinking of writing a story to it and publishing it in our newsletter. 
So maybe you also want to sign up for our newsletter on the past website. In contrast, the FAIR principles um, were established during a workshop in 2015 and was published a year later in a Nature article. And um, FAIR is actually promoted very heavily in, in contrast to Alcoa, which is promoted by the, um, in the WHO guidance in section nine on good documentation practice. So um, let's briefly dive into Alcoa and the Alcoa principles. And the first item here is attributable or who acquired the data or performed an, an action on them. So basically it means that the originator of the data must be uniquely identifiable. And this is not only by spoken knowledge in the lab, but also um, by the data, data records. So to adhere to this item, it is required that your names or initials are always added to the data records. This can be indicated in any format of the lab notebook or in the file names. The second item is legible, or can you read and understand the data? This is important because only this will allow full reconstruction of the data by the people interested in them. And to adhere to this item, it's on the one hand important to take care of handwriting um, if you still do that. Um, and on the other hand, also thinking of digital data, that it is important to be able to access it um, so that you use a widely readable format to save these data and not one that expires in, in, in five years or is not used anymore um, in five years from now. The next item, the C, is contemporaneous. That means that the data have to be recorded when it happens. So best, of course, always do it immediately at the end of the day or at specific reserved time during the week. That was at least my strategy and I always wanted to do it on a Friday afternoon, but in the end, then I postpone it and um, things were always piling up. So in the end, for me, best was to just do it on Thursday afternoon, 4 p.m. And that's when I always yeah, record, uh, did the, the lab notebook entries and put everything in order. The O is for original and asks whether all research data are saved in its original format. <clears throat> so, um, in the, so they should be in the original format and in the exact same way as recorded and in a way that they cannot be altered. I think that must be a general rule actually that the raw data are saved in a non-readable way. In an sorry, in a read-only way. The next item, accurate, it means that all details should be recorded and corrected um, truthfully. In practice, this means that special attention should be given to the correctness of the data records and all the details. And of course, errors happen, but when they do, they should be immediately corrected and appropriately managed. So this means, for example, that they should be documented and eventually discussed among colleagues. So these are the five Alcoa items and the plus items is the first one is complete. And it basically means are all data included, such as any repeats, outliers, controls, markers, or pre-analysis, and so on. So meaning are all steps of the experiment and of the data included in the documentation to fully understand and reconstruct the experiment. The data should also be consistent, meaning that all elements should be in chronological order and as planned. And this is also, of course, true for the data analysis and the reporting. The next item, endurable, which I mentioned before, is asking whether all data records are saved for an extended time period. 
And the last item um, is about availability of the data. So data need to be kept in a format that can be accessed for review over the lifetime of the record. For example, raw data presented in a graph in a publication should always be available. <clears throat> so um, also thinking of the publication, that it should always be able to go back to the original data. So these are the Alcoa Plus principles. And now we want to switch gears and come to the FAIR principle. So um, I actually would say that FAIR is kind of the of more famous brother or sister. Um, why? Because it's, for example, also um, recognized in geological sciences that they should adhere to these FAIR principles. Or there is even a fairy tale, a nice story with elves <laughs> looking for some treasures, which are the data written about fair. So it's certainly fun, fun to read and introduces the topic quite nicely. Anyway, let's briefly look into fair, um, which can only be yeah, on the surface because there's uh, much more information about it. So findable, not very surprisingly, means that the data must be <laughs> findable. And as mentioned earlier, this is not always trivial and FAIR even requests here that there is a global unique identifier for all data records. And this indicates kind of the difference to Alcoa, where Alcoa is on the, the data in the lab and this is about publishing the data and um, fitting a global identifier to it. And additionally, it also means that um, data should be findable by humans and computers. For example, if you think of text mining or doing automatic analysis for systematic reviews or so. So the second letter stands for accessible. And I would say that this item is very similar to some of the attributes of Alcoa. So here it's important to describe or at least understand the path in which data can be accessed. And FAIR also requests here that some kind of authorization and authentication um, barriers should be considered and also overcome to have this access to the data. This next item, interoperable, um, refers to the integration with other data sets and systems. That means that data sets can be used across different labs. So also thinking of this collaboration that you need to speak the same language. And one example here is in, in vivo research that some labs write just M, other labs write mail, and another lab might use the symbol. And even so, humans are able to understand it quite easily, computers don't. So this is something to think about. And this last letter of FAIR stands for reusable and refers to the data package that comes with the actual data, which is also referred to the metadata. And here again, it's quite a big overlap to Alcoa. Um, it, it's basically saying that you need to describe your actual data with enough metadata to really make them understandable. Easiest example, if you have a table, you need to name the rows and the um, columns so that you can identify it. But also thinking of um, the equipment that was used to gather the data or exposure times and so on. So with this, you have on one slide again, these two principles that I hope um, you will remember, or maybe at least one of them if you are a researcher starting your career and doing more experiments in the lab, then I think Alcoa might be more interesting or important for you. And uh, if you're at a later stage, then maybe have another look into FAIR, um, uh, how to make your 
publish data, basically fair compliant, put them in a fair way, which is also currently um, requested by funders. So, and this is my last slide, where we'll try to give a little bit more advice, hopefully practical advice for you. And this first item, which I find just very important for daily lab work is to establish a new unique study or experimental ID, since this will really help to organize your data, to connect them, um, to, yeah, to have reference in there, and also find them again after a longer period of time. This second item um, is about using templates, which are also I found very, very useful and handy. That using these templates just as often as possible really makes work easier. Because all you have to do then is taking the templates, save it as a separate file, and adjust things to fit the current setting. And this will create so much consistency in the documentation, and it always helps also me not to forget things. So the third item is about establishing a routine, and um, this also helps when performing experiments. And this, of course, doesn't mean that you should lose any creativity, but really establishing a routine also for the little things, like um, you create a new file, a new document, and you always put the date as a, as a suffix, as, as we have established in our company, and everybody is doing it. And then, yeah, there is also some, some consistency in here. Um, this is actually a, yeah, uh, from a, a Nature a publication by Monia Baker, who wrote here some ideas, uh, put some thoughts together, how to write, create, or how to create reproducible protocols. And she gives also some nice ideas. And this one quite stuck with me. She's basically say, saying um, in one of these advices, um, write less, but show more. And I think that also kind of makes sense. If you can take a video or an image of something, that this also tells so much more than um, written notes. So also something to think about, especially since all we all have our phone, or <laughs> at least. Uh, I have my phone all, all the time with me, basically. Um, and here, this other point also, which I touched upon already um, when talking about establishing a routine, aligning between lab members, um, very helpful. Um, because, yeah, it, it creates this unity within a research lab and it helps to avoid any errors um, and miscommunication. So maybe also here dedicating five minutes of the weekly lab meeting to quality aspects and discuss quality there might already be a huge step forward towards data integrity and have some more consistent procedures. And I also put down here the use of a data management plan um, that might be more important for these collaborations that were mentioned by Renza, or also when a, a writing grant applicants. At least I know that here in Europe, um, many funders actually also request now a data management plan. And um, it, it can make sense if you start a project to first sit down and think which data will I get, where do I want to publish it, maybe, maybe in an, uh, um, open source platform or so. So having that already at an, quite an early stage um, might also be um, very helpful to reach more data integrity. And with this, I want to close my presentation. And um, yeah, we can um, discuss any things, um, questions you have regarding um, the presentation. Or also here some questions. Um, so what do you think? Um, does it make sense to apply Alcoa and FAIR? Where do you see oh, um, challenges? <laughs> that, sh that should be um, challenges. Do you see any challenges uh, in your daily lab work to apply them?
or what would be the biggest challenge in your setting? So, um, yeah, with that, I end my presentation. Uh, yeah, if, if I can pitch in, like, what, what would you, like, it's a lot of letters, right? I mean, uh, FAIR, FAIR is very know, well known, I think, uh, at least in the open science people these days. Alcoa, not really, uh, although I think it has sensible recommendation. I think it might be more useful to somebody who's, who, who's I mean, I'm, to, a, to a student, for example, like, who's actually collecting data rather than, than publishing, I think it's, it's it's actually the better the better set. But like uh, to teach both, it's like it, it's, it's a lot of letters, right? Like it's like uh, Alco. It's <laughs> so like, what's your approach for 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 for, for teaching? Do you start? Uh, uh, sh 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 should we just show both? Uh, do we have a way to reconcile them? Or yeah, uh, just j j just for simplicity. I mean, what should I be doing as a Uh, maybe indeed this one slide with the Alcoa principles and the questions that can uh, be used by the student when um, when documenting as kind of guidance that makes sense. But but maybe for you as a uh, um, well-known scientist uh, who has a proven track record, then maybe um, this these fair principles make more sense. Yeah. So uh, it kind of depends. Okay. Sorry. Uh, we have, a, a, in fact, an, a statement by Dr. Sileni saying that developers uh, should have fair principles in mind when preparing software. I can't agree more because, well, much of the challenges you asked for, well, what are your challenges? To, to keep record, to, to keep track of everybody's doing what they should do in a proper way. And this is the old way, the weekly uh, lab meeting. It's too hard to, to, to follow the track. So uh, it's a, uh, I think uh, Dr. Sileni's message here is for the engineers uh, among us. So we are in need to set um, tools to keep track of the lab's behavior. <laughs> we have full behavior. Thank you, Dr. Sileni, for reminding me to remind the engineers. So any other any other questions? We have some time now, uh, just because uh, at um, well, we started, uh, let us, well, we are just in time. We have programmed a, a, a 10 minutes interval now, uh, so we can rest our eyes and ears and Flavinho can go around. Um, a little point because um, maybe it can be done now in the break um, of the people who attend. We have. Are, are we still online? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So um, be below the video, there are some links to um, short questionnaires, and. Um, if the audience is interested in these uh, short questionnaires, um, which also deal with biases, a bit more general biases, um, please have a look at them. They're, I hope, a little bit fun and nice to do. And um, if there are enough respondents, then at the end, um, after all of us talk, um, we will also show the results. That would be so, great. Um, yeah, below the video, please have a look. And I reinforce, please ask them. It's nice. It's fun. And this will help us to improve. Great. And let's go to interval. 
let's rest our eyes. Uh, it's 10 minutes and um, see, I, I use the time, the Brazilian time now. Uh, we'll be back at the um, 12, 14 with uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Steckler. Okay, thank you very much.
Pode começar. It's okay. Uh, let's come back. And I'd like to 
to welcome uh, Professor Thomas uh, Steckler here from the EQIPG uh, project. And well, Dr. Thomas, the floor is yours. Let us okay. start. So let me, thank you let very me much start. for being with us. Very, very good, thank you. Uh, so let me start again. Um, I will talk to you in the next uh, couple of minutes about research rigor and why it is relevant to recognize studies that have high or low rigor in research. Um, I will talk to you as the ex-project leader of the EQUIP consortium that I'm pretty sure Martin mentioned to you already uh, stopped uh, earlier this year after four years running time. Uh, but of course, the tools and, and the quality system that has been developed by the cons consortium is still alive and, and very active. And, and Renza mentioned parts of that already as well in her talk. Now, <clears throat> let's, let's start with a short uh, definition of what we mean when we talk about rigor in research. Essentially, it means that if you conduct an experiment, it is done exact, it's conducted carefully, and with high precision and accuracy. Okay. What is important to realize, so is that <clears throat> rigor doesn't guarantee everything is fine. It just means that there is a higher likelihood that uh, you will be able to produce uh, uh, good data and that the data that have been generated can be reproduced later on. The second point to make is that if you have a rigorous study, it doesn't mean it is necessarily a robust study. Yeah, that's another important distinction to make because when we look at rigor in research, we really focus on what is called internal validity. While when we talk about robustness in a study, we are talking about external validity, meaning essentially whether a study is generalizable yeah, um, across the population, or more specifically when it comes to, for instance, treatment developments, whether a preclinical finding is translatable into patients. Rigor does not mean a study can be translated into, into patient population. Now, <clears throat> there is, I think, pretty strong evidence that uh, rigor in research, unfortunately, is pretty poor. This here shows you some data from Kilkenny and colleagues published uh, in 2009, one of the first studies dealing with the topic, looking at uh, animal studies published uh, in the time frame of 1999 to 2005. And they focused on blinding, whether blinding was reported in these uh, publications and whether randomization was reported. And they broke it also down <clears throat> according to species uh, tested. And while there was some di differences across the species, what you can see pretty clearly is that the reporting rate of blinding and randomization at that point in time was pretty poor. That's an issue because it might mean that rigor of these reported studies is poor as well. Now, has that changed? Unfortunately, not too much. There are some journals that took an extra effort and where apparently reporting practices have improved. But lo and behold, in the vast majority of cases, it didn't. And this is a study from Ramirez that essentially followed up on this and now looked in the time frame from 2006 to 2016. And that's in the cardiovascular field, looking at various journals uh, publishing cardiovascular papers. And what you can see here is that essentially over this 10 year time frame, there wasn't any change, whether it concerned blinding, whether it concerned randomization or sample size estimation. So that's of course a sobering outcome of, of that study. Now, what does it mean for you in practical terms? Uh, let's assume for a moment you would work in a pharmaceutical company and your task would be to come up with a new anxiolytic compound. Okay, What you would normally do as a first step, you will scan the literature and check what is readily available, what is published. And say for sake of argument, <clears throat> you come across this issue of nature genetics. It's a bit outdated by now from 2000, but I think for our purposes, highly interesting. 
So in that particular issue, three articles were published head to head. All three articles dealt with a knockout mouse, a knockout of the corticotropin releasing hormone receptor 2, and looking at the effect of that knockout. Uh, so this just gives you some commonalities across the papers. In all three papers, the receptor was knock out, knocked out. In all three papers, the same background strains were used, C57 black 6 J mice and 129 SVJ mice. And in all three papers, a test of anxiety-related behavior was employed, the elevated plasmase. For those that are not familiar with it, it's shown schematically here. Essentially, it's, it's, it's a cross that is elevated from the ground. And two of the arms are sheltered by walls, and two of the arms are open. Now, the idea is that an, a rodent, be it a mouse or be it a rat, um, finds the entrances in the open arms more aversive. Consequently, if you have a mouse that is very anxious, it will spend more time in the closed arms as opposed to the open arms. Um, it will have less entries into the open arms as well. An animal that is less anxious should spend more time in the open arms as well. And that's schematically see, seen here from publication by Kreuter et al. Now let's go back to the publications. <clears throat> in that first publication from Tracy Bayer, um, the elevated plasmase was used to look at the anxiety-related behavior in the CH2 knockout mice. And what you can clearly see is that the mutant animals did spend less time in the open arms and also had less entries into the open arms, and irrespective of whether we talk about male mice or female mice. That means that those animals would be potentially more anxious. And conversely, if you would want to develop an anxiolytic drug, you could come to the conclusion that it might be a good idea if you would develop an agonist as a CRF2 receptor to, enhance, to, 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 to have an anxiolytic drug. That's great news, of course. Now go to the second publication. That's a paper by Kishimoto. Same knockout, same background strain, same test. Also male and female animals were tested. In that study, Again, there was seemingly a higher anxiety-related behavior in the male knockout mice. However, no effect was seen in females. That's a bit of a bummer because when you look at the uh, frequency of anxiety disorders, you will see that in humans, anxiety disorders are more frequent in females than in male patients. So it might raise some questions for you. Now let's go to the third paper by Costa and colleagues. They also tested the CRF2 knockout mice. They also used the elevated plasmase. In that case, they only looked at male animals, male animals that were uh, apparently more anxious in the first two studies. In that third paper, there was no effect of the knockout in the elevated plasmase whatsoever. Of course, this is a bummer because it might mean that your initial hope for the target has vanished. And in fact, this would be your second step. You possibly would fall into despair. Now, let's have a closer look at these three studies. In all three studies now, we focus only on the male animals because they were used in all three papers. Uh, in all three studies, <clears throat> they, they used the elevated plasmase. Um, there was a slight difference in animal numbers. Um, in the Bayer paper, they talked about seven animals were tested per genotype. In the Kishimoto and Costa papers, it wasn't quite as clear because they, they gave you a range of, of numbers from 8 to 13. In all three papers, they showed mean and standard error of the mean in their graphs. In Bale's paper, no information was provided about blinding, randomization, or sample size calculation. And the same goes for the Kishimoto paper. In the cost paper, they mentioned that they had blinded outcome assessment. 
That is good, of course, but we have no information again about randomization or whether the sample size was actually calculated up front. So there is a potential issue here already in all three publications. When you calculate the power post hoc, and there is an issue here with this post hoc calculation of power, so we have to be careful. But, but for the sake of argument here, let's do that. You see that power in all three studies is, is relatively low. In Bayer, they possibly still <clears throat> fare best, you know, um, but certainly in the Kishimoto paper, power is low. And, and, and also the Costa paper has a low power. What's interesting in the Costa paper, so, is that they talk in the paper about showing representative data out of five independent experiments. Unfortunately, they don't show the data from the other four experiments. So we don't really know what went on. When we look at the animal characteristics, in the Bale paper, they used animals aged between, say, five and, and six months. Animals were group housed and handled up front. In the Kishimoto paper, animals were younger, two to three months. They were single housed and they were not handled. They were naive at time of testing. And in the Costa paper, we know that the age was in between the first two papers, but there isn't any information about the housing conditions or the handling of the animals. When it comes to the test itself, <clears throat> in the Bay paper, they only refer to another paper and say the elevated plus mass was the same as described, described previously. So when you look at that previous description, the Maze was made of black plastic. It was raised 30 centimeters above the ground, and it has a central platform of five, five, five centimeters. Importantly, the open arm illumination was low with six looks only. In the Kishimoto paper, the light intensity was more than 100 fold offset in the open arm. So it was much brighter. And we know that this also has an effect on anxiety-related behavior in rodents. We have no other information about the mate, make of, of the mace. So. Interestingly, in both of those studies, scoring was manually. So there was an experimenter that, that would score time and entries. Now, that's interesting also in light of the fact that there was no blinding mentioned in those papers, meaning there is a potential source of bias. In the Costa paper, we only know what the size of the center platform was. We have no idea what the make of the elevated plus mace was otherwise. And the light intensity was somewhere in between the first two papers again. Interestingly here, they used video tracking. So it was an automated scoring, um, which together with the blinded outcome assessment might indeed make those data more reliable. But the conclusion here really is that, lo and behold, the, we can question the internal validity of those studies. And of course, with all these differences, we can ask whether it is, or whether it is really surprising that there wasn't much of replicability across the three experiments. On top of that, when we talk about the external validity again, we have to be clear that many people like to talk about the elevated plus maze as a test predicting um, anxiolytic or anxiogenic effects in men. But reality is that this test was validated using benzodiazepine drugs. Benzodiazepines are potent anxiolytic drugs, but also potent anxiolytic drugs are uh, a number of antidepressants. And antidepressants normally do not show changes in anxiety related behavior in the elevated plus maze. So we can also ask, is there really good external validity or is there really good translatability of those data? So I think this example really is meant to illustrate the caveats you're facing when you're looking at published studies in the literature. But it's not only neuroscience that suffers here. There is every area of biomedical research where you face similar issues. This is by now, I think, famous paper from Bayer, where they tried to reproduce uh, published findings in the field of oncology, women's health, and cardiovascular research. And lo and behold, in the vast majority of cases, 
they fail to replicate those studies. And of course, there could be different reasons for these failures. You know, it could be that there is again an experimental design issue that the methods weren't described well enough, um, that bias wasn't really well controlled. It could be even some misrepresentation of data, you know, we, we don't know. But the fact is that again, studies could not be reproduced. I don't know why we're now jumping, but anyway, we can just continue here. It's not just an issue of the published literature. It's the same, for instance, when you look at patents. Yeah. So patents are really based on the assumption that an invention that is described will work. And often it's scientific experiments that are used to really <clears throat> illustrate that point. Also preclinical experiments. Importantly, once a patent is granted, it's presumed valid. Yeah, and the, it's also presumed that the experiments that are described in the patent would work as well. Now, what happens if an experiment described in a patent would not work? Would it make the patent invalid? Now, there's no clear answer here. Um, it would, the clear answer here is really that it depends. Yeah. Um, what is clear is that it's an inoperable patent, as it is called, and then really the decision uh, whether a patent should be invalidated or not depends on the degree of irreproducibility. But there are people that really make a, make a call here and, and want to invalidate those patents if reported findings could not be reproduced. Now, here's a study from Freilich uh, published last year. She looked at uh, what was reported in, in, in a patent yeah, and, and looked at uh, 250 patents, annual studies only, again, in the time range of from 2001 to 2016. What's interesting here is that, is that blinding and randomization were hardly reported in patents either. So it's not just the published scientific literature that suffers here, but it's the same for, for other publicly available sources reporting experimental outcomes. Interestingly here as well is that sample size, and I'm not talking sample size calculation, I'm just talking about the number of animals used in an experiment was only reported in just above 50% of, of the papers and the same if for, for, uh, for statistical analysis, which was not uh, reported in about 40% of the patents. But uh, the failure to reproduce uh, published results is not only related um, to low rigor uh, or what is reported in a, in a paper, it almost comes natural. Yeah? What we have to realize here is that when we talk about the significant finding of P smaller 0.05, this is only a probability again. Yeah? It's a probability that a real effect exists, it means there is also a chance that what you see is false. Yeah, that, that's very important. And so you have false positive findings and you have false negative findings in an experiment. And John Ioannidis wrote an ex excellent paper on that by now also famous called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. If you haven't read it yet, I would strongly recommend you to do so. And he describes the false, oh, the false discovery rate which is the probability that a real effect does not exist if a significant result has been obtained. And what's interesting and important to note here is that if you have small studies with, you know, very small number of animals or samples, I should say, because it's not just limited to animal studies. If you have small effect sizes, if you have a power that is low in your study, also if you do not blind your study uh, or randomize, um, the chances is that you have a high false discovery rate. And to illustrate <clears throat> that issue for, power, for, for studies that have low powers, I, I would like to give you the following examples. Suppose you have a thousand hypotheses or a thousand experiments you want to run. And suppose also that 10% so 100 of those experimental outcomes would be true. Okay, you would see this here in the green uh, box. Now, if we 
have a low power of 0.2, it means <clears throat> that you have 20% of those positive outcomes that are true positives. Again, highlighted here in green. But you would also have 80 of those that are false negatives, highlighted in red. And you have a false positive rate with an alpha of 0.05, meaning that you have out of those 900 uh, um, experiments you're left with, you have 45 that show a false positive effect. Okay. So you see that <clears throat> you don't really end up with a lot of true positives out of your experiments. Now, um, if you add publication bias, which means people happily report the positive findings, but uh, bin the negative findings, you will end up with 65 experiments that make it into the published literature. Okay. If you just take those publications, you end up with close to 70% false positives. So if you have that, it might be no surprise that you cannot reproduce a finding. And this is something that you see happening uh, throughout the literature. That's a study from Daniele Fanelli, published in 2012. And he really looked very broad in, in various areas of, 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 of research, not only biomedicine, but beyond. And lo and behold, the vast majority of findings that are in the literature show a positive outcome. Why? When you would have an unbiased approach, you would have expected many more negative results being published. Now, coming back to our <clears throat> example with the CF2 receptor knockout and the elevated plasmase. What would that mean if, if those three studies would not have published head to head? Okay, you possibly would end up with only one study that would really show this robust uh, change in anxiety related behavior being published. Okay, even worse if you would have that second study only showing the male mouse effects and uh, suppressing the outcome in the females. You would even have two studies where you seemingly have positive outcomes. That means that you would bias your decision about the target and you would cherry pick and you would end up with a lot of efforts trying to develop your anxiolytic drugs when in fact the target is possibly not valid. Now, you can enhance your probability of success. And this is again showing you the example I've showed you before. If you would increase your power, for instance, if you increase it to 0.8, and if you would adhere to a more stringent P level. If you do that, you end up with slightly more experiments that would be published, even with this publication bias in mind. But with the higher power and the more string and P, you would end up with only 10% false positives. Now, in the ideal world, of course, you would have all the thousand experiments being published. Okay. And then your false positive rate would really drop substantially below 1%. And that would make the outcome of all these studies much more reliable. There are a number of different sources why you have poor rhythm. <clears throat> and for time reasons, I, I don't want to go into all of those. Um, but flawed experimental design is one. And, and I've shown you some example here. Use of faulty tools would be another one where people assume they, for instance, deal with one cell line when um, they test different cells. As an example, <clears throat> data representation might be flawed as well. Of course, there are issues related to competition, publication, pressure, negative data, publication bias that come into play, cherry picking, harking, hypothesizing after the research outcomes are known, or p-hacking would be other reasons why you find studies with poor vigor. But what is the impact of poor vigor? Why is it so important that you recognize it um, or that you try to avoid it in your own studies. Well, 
I think there are a number of issues related. You waste headcounts because people spend an enormous amount of time trying to run experiments based on hypotheses that are not really true. You waste resources, you know, uh, you spend a lot of money on, on uh, experiments that are mute. You waste your time. And of course, in case of animal studies, you waste animals. So there's an ethical issue here as well. To just give you some examples, this was <clears throat> a paper published by Leonard Friedman in 2015, looking at the economics of irreproducibility. He estimated <clears throat> that there is an irreproducibility rate of about 50% in the academic publications, meaning that when you look at the expenditure uh, of research in the US alone, which is about, was about 28 billion at that time, you would waste 50% of that. And if we assume the same for um, industry, and there's not much reason why we should assume that it's vastly different, um, you can see here what, what is spent by R&D efforts in industry. In 2013, the estimation was again about 50 billion. And if we assume again a, an irreversibility rate of 50%, it means that half of it was wasted. So those are tremendous amount of money yeah, that are poured into non-reproducible research. So if you want to save money, if you want to use your money more consciously for, for, for better research, then you have one reason why you should pay attention to the rigor in uh, non-clinical research. Wasting animals is another issue. I said before, it's an ethical uh, uh, point to consider. Now we know that power is a function of sample size. Okay. In other words, it's a function of animal numbers. If you go for classical numbers and you see many, many studies published with say N of 10, N of less than 10 even per group, you will end up with, with studies that are low powered. Okay. But of course, those are data that are non-conclusive. In other words, the chances of wasting an animal would be, <coughs> excuse me, would be uh, 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 exactly the opposite to the, the power function. Yeah, and so if you go with your low animal numbers, you have a high probability that you just wasted animals in in your study. That has been recognized, and uh, in 2015 there were uh, UK funders that really started to ask for appropriately powered studies proposals uh, uh, if, if people would want to apply for grants and uh, and, and they would really want to have robust and, 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 and rigorous studies being proposed. Of course, I'd like to mention that it's not only the poor experimental design that risks wasting animals, but of course also the um, status of the animal has a tremendous effect on the outcome of your study. One is really linked with the other. Yeah? So if you want to have reliable data, reproducible data, robust data, you need to have animals that are in good conditions. Only if you have healthy animals, you will have predictable data. And so you have many factors that are adherent to an animal facility that would uh, influence the outcome of your data generated with these animals, be it the genetics, be it uh, um, other biological determinants, be it the holding conditions, you know, um, the humidity, the temperature, the bedding material, all of that might interfere with your study. To just give you some examples here, it is well known by now that uh, the degree of enrichment will affect neural plasticity in the brains of animals. Uh, it's shown that uh, the social housing status has an effect on, for instance, receptor expression in the brain. This is monkey data, uh, single housed monkeys versus socially housed monkeys, and the two receptor expression in the brain is different. 
It's known that the microbiome has an effect on reproducibility of data. And also the housing temperature, for instance, can have an effect on tumor growth in, in animals. So there are a lot of factors that, that come into play here and that should not be neglected. But most important, of course, is that you risk that you endanger patients. And I'd like to give you an example <coughs> that uh, took place a couple of years ago in France. Uh, there was a, a what's called a phase one clinical trial. So it was a safety trial in healthy volunteers. And uh, the healthy volunteers that, that got a new uh, uh, drug um, to, to look at the safety profile had severe side effects. And in fact, unfortunately, there were even some fatalities. Yeah? So people died. And uh, because of that, um, the, the French authorities did put uh, uh, a committee in place that would uh, examine what happened. And that committee came up with a number of recommendations. And I just highlight two of those. One was related to data transparency, because they felt that the data that were in the investigator brochure were not transparent enough. Yeah? Uh, and the other one was related to the preclinical data. And uh, they said that uh, the pharmacology studies that were run uh, were not sufficiently complete. Of course, this ties directly into our discussion about research rigor as well. Now, what can you do for your own research? There are tools available that can help. And, and Renza did mention the equipped quality system already. And I'm, I'm pretty sure Martin did as well. Um, so the equipped quality system contains a set of core requirements and, and uh, is supported by additional tools to, to help you dealing with those requirements. I just like to focus here on, on, on one set, uh, which is related to study design and research rigor. And you can see here, there are a number of criteria that are addressed in the equipped quality system that uh, deals with a pre defined study plan, study hypothesis being formulated up front, blinding, randomization, and so on. And depending on the purpose of your research, the quality system has different recommendations. In general, most of those uh, uh, criteria should be adhered to, irrespective of what type of research you're doing. So that's a recommendation only. So you can, of course, uh, neglect it. The only uh, criterion that is not really uh, uh, recommended for all research would be pre-registration because if you have explorative studies, it might be different, difficult to pre-register because you don't have an ad hoc hypothesis upfront. <coughs> if you have a confirmatory study or hypothesis testing study, whatever you want to call it, the criteria are more stringent. And there are a number of required criteria to be fulfilled uh, that were uh, postulated by the quality system, like the predefined study plan, the hypothesis that should be in place. Um, blinding and randomization is strongly recommended. Uh, we realize that uh, there could be exceptions why that is not possible, and that needs then to be justified. And also pre-registration is recommended. So you could use this as a guide for your own research activities. If you want to judge published literature, I would recommend you to go to the ARRIVE 2.0 guidelines because they have a number of tools available. They're primarily focused on, again, researchers that want to publish their papers, but you have also tools for authors and readers available. So the ARRIVE 2.0 guidelines have the goal to maximize the output, again, focused on animal research and to reduce research waste. And um, they propagate reporting of all the information that allows an assessment of the reliability of the published results to give enough methodological details to also put the research that is published into context uh, to help the reader to judge the relevance of the data 
and also to give sufficient metadata information. Now, there are two checklists that you can use as a reader. Um, it's an author checklist originally, but you can use it again to just scan through a paper to see what's, what's reported and what's not reported. The one checklist is called the Essential 10, and it's really the core requirements that should be in a good paper. And then we have, there is a recommended set. If you put the Essential 10 and the recommended set together, it really reflects best practice. It helps you as an author if you want to write your paper. But importantly for our discussion today, it helps you also as a reader to very rapidly scan through a paper and see whether all the crucial information is available. Okay, And it allows you to judge the reliability of the findings. So to conclude, what we can say here is there is a need to improve rigor in non-clinical research. It still exists because you want to reduce waste in research. You want to improve replicability of published data. Only if you have rigorous data, you can come to good decisions. So you want to facilitate decision making, which is important, be it that you want to decide on your next study, be it because you want to advance a drug development program or you want to decide to stop it. And of course, once you enter the, the, the patient world, you have to make sure that you don't put patients at risk. And there are tools available that can help. If you want to run your own studies, uh, then I think the equipped quality system could be very useful. And of course, that goes far beyond uh, uh, just the, the, the conduct of research. And if you want to judge uh, the published data, then I think going to the arrive checklists uh, is also very useful. And I'd like to end here and, and thank for your attention. And I'm open for questions. OK, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thomas for this fantastic, uh, well, spooky too, <laughs> but fantastic talk. And we um, we have some minutes uh, for questions. Uh, here, I think I, I, we have at least two or three minutes. Uh, I always take the first question here. But <laughs> Uh, okay. I, I wasn't aware of it. I was very curious about this nature neuroscience example. I wasn't aware of this. So, uh, first question, how, how did they get to be published head to head? Was it just a coincidence that like everybody submitted to nature neuroscience? Mm -hmm. And second, do you think, I mean, uh, they're not like, uh, for, for the sample size, I don't think the results are like, oh, that different or unexpected. I mean, do you think that could be just a matter of, 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 of vibration around the a true effect, or do you think there there has to there there's actual heterogeneity? Because I mean, from the sample sizes and the and, and the bars, I just thought this could be just like random noise, but I don't know what what's your opinion on it. Yeah, but exactly the, to to your to your second question, that is exactly the issue. Yeah, I think uh, with 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 the power that well, admittedly they should have calculated the power up front. We don't know whether they have done it or not because it wasn't reported. Um, if they haven't done it, that's, that's that's too bad. If they have done it, if it was low, uh, it's even worse. Um, uh, if they would have a, had a more stringent power, say of 0.8 for sake of argument, uh, the data that, that would have been generated should have been more conclusive. Yeah? It, what we have now is a situation uh, that it makes it difficult to really uh, conclude on, on this data published. Of course, uh, there are other factors coming into play here as well, like we don't really know whether blinding or, or randomization was was uh, adhered to. Yeah? Um, to your first question, how they managed to publish head to head, um, I can only speculate, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is just what, what happened. Um, uh, kudos to the editor, I would say, you know, um, that, that had the courage to publish those three studies head to head because it really um, made, made uh, uh, the, the results much more valuable in my view, even though they, they 
are confusing uh, to a certain degree, but as a reader, I think you can only be grateful if, if you have the outcome of those studies being there. Because otherwise, if you would look at the individual paper, you would either be completely disappointed because you see only the paper with the negative data, or you would see the paper with the overtly positive data and you would be excited. But now, of course, uh, you realize you have to take those data with a grain of salt. To be also fair, it's not only the behavioral data that were published. Huh? They, in, in those papers, they had, they had many more uh, data that, that were published as well. But the behavioral data are striking. Yep. Well, uh, uh, in the chat, we have no questions to the moment. If a person one I will send to you, thank you very much again. That's it's a very enlightening and I repeat, uh, spooking scenery. <laughs> but we, we that we must fight. Uh, it's a to require new social agreement. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'd like so to uh, bring the, the floor to Olavo Amaral, to Dr. Olavo Amaral, uh, for his presentation. Thank you very much for being with you. Uh, we, uh, Olavo, please. Hi. Yes, so I'll try to share my screen here. Uh, let's see if this works. And now we'll put the oops, in full screen. Uh, so uh, can you see my slides around? Uh, no? OK. So. Uh, I'm the local person, so try to to give a, a, a more uh, uh, actually a personal perspective of, of projects we have conducted here that try to build collaborative networks for reproducible science, which I think is a common topic here. So uh, I won't argue that reproducibility is a project uh, is a problem. I think most people have uh, made this point already. We have a large fraction of scientific articles in basic biomedical science that seem to contain irre irreproducible results. I think Thomas and, and Malcolm and uh, everybody else has been, uh, I mean, ha have been convincing about this. That said, I think there are different paths to improvement. I think there's different ways to try to bring robustness to basic science. And I think people have hinted at this uh, uh, throughout the talks, right? I mean, you can have better standards for every individual experiment, uh, which is uh, a great solution, but a costly solution as well, because like if everybody's having uh, a pre-registered, uh, high-powered study, I mean, this will make, I mean, a a everything takes effort, even if it's a little bit of effort. Second one, which I think Malcolm talked more about is, is, is data synthesis. I mean, have to, let's try to put the literature together for to have uh, more reliable conclusions. And the third is actually like, let's try to build up the culture of having large-scale conformatory experiments, at least for some uh, things that we judge important to to reproduce. Uh, so uh, so first edition, I think we've talked a lot about here, uh, which is <clears throat> actually I think what most people focus on when they talk about reproducibility. I mean, everybody can do a little bit uh, to do a little bit better, right? So we can <clears throat> implement bias control measures such as blinding randomization. We can increase statistical power and actually uh, calculate our statistical power, which most people would not do in basic science. Uh, in terms of, uh, I, I, I might be missing the terminology here, according to Thomas, but uh, in terms of building a robustness rather than rigor, you might want to implement implement uh, heterogeneity in study samples, so use different methods, use different animals in terms of seeing if your conclusions are robust. You might pre-register your analysis plan. Uh, we have a lot of uh, work on using reporting checklists such as Arrive and sharing data on code uh, using FAIR principles, as, as Bjorn mentioned. Uh, and these are all great solutions. Uh, some of them are actually very simple, some are harder. Uh, that said, uh, they're all sensible measures, but uh, they, they all have variable costs. I mean, they might be minimal, such as blinding, or doing a sample size calculation, which are very simple. Uh, 
but actually increasing your statistical power might use a lot of animals. Implementing heterogeneity can be very hard. Uh, Pre-registering is not for everybody because some, some science is just too exploratory. So like adding this for every experiment in the biomedical sciences may be unfeasible. I mean, uh, if you were doing this uh, very uh, uh, handicrafted discovery science, which is like a lot of different methods in small animals to, to build up a theory, uh, I mean, this is fun. Uh, this is great. I mean, stuff comes out of this, but like, there's no way you can pre-register this 30, 40 experiments, nature papers, in which every experiment is very small, actually. And uh, so uh, I think uh, some science must actually be left exploratory. I mean, sometimes you're trying to predefine everything can actually hamper healthy exploration. Uh, data synthesis also has caveats, right? Uh, I mean, it's, it sounds very sensible, like, hey, we have hundreds of papers out there, can we just build solid conclusions if we put data together? Uh, maybe, not sure. I mean, of course, if you consider that a lot of the, uh, as we talked about a lot this morning, uh, a lot of data is actually low quality in terms of rigor, it's not blinded, it's not randomized. Uh, then uh, if you take uh, studies that are not reliable and you synthesize them, you end up with conclusions that are not reliable, just the garbage in, uh, garbage out uh, principle, right? More than that, uh, there's a fair share of publication bias that have been, ha has been shown in, in multiple areas of, of basic science. So we're, we're very likely to be missing a fair share of the existing data, right? Uh, of course, it's, it's interesting to actually do synthesis to, to get to know this. I mean, the best way to detect publication bias is to do a meta-analysis, but uh, it's, uh, I think it puts a big grain of salt of whether we should be really trusting estimates that come out of the published literature. So my skeptical conclusion is like, at, at the current point at least, I, I, I would like this to be different, but like the literature as it is, is not really built for synthesis. Uh, apart from uh, the, 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 the problems of missing data and reliable data, it's actually very hard to do a systematic review, you have data uh, in, in this very big bar graph. You have to like extract manually, like put a scale here and measure each bar to get the numbers out of uh, out of this. So like we're very bad at sharing data in a way that's useful for synthesis. So we have a lot to improve in terms of of, of making data more more amenable to synthesis. As well. So so even if you have the patience to do a meta analysis, you still might end up with unreliable conclusions. So I think uh, again, it's a great way to show problems, uh, as I think Malcolm argued. Uh, it's, I'm not sure you, the answers you get from meta-analysis of the very exploratory, very non-rigorous, sometimes uh, basic biomedical literature can be unreliable as well. So I think uh, we should be talking about how to build confirmatory experiments. Uh, I think uh, Equipped uh, talks a little bit about this in terms of certifying and, and, and building up internal validity, but there's also building up uh, external validity and, 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 and robustness, right? I think um, this is actually by, by Malcolm McLeod and, and, and Jeff Mojo, but they do argue that we should have tiers of evidence. Some studies that this might be exploratory, but at some point you want to do this big, large, generalized, generalized ability study. Uh, ideally, in a lot of labs, uh, in terms of testing whether this is robust enough to go on to clinical trial. And of course, confirming gen robustness or generalizability of like how much a study is actually robust to small changes in samples, in methods, uh, in other things, is actually something very hard to do uh, at the level of an individual lab. Uh, so you do uh, want to uh, I mean, you, you can try to do this, but, but, but like at some point, like there's so, just so many conditions, one lab can vary. So if you want to like use multiple methods, use multiple or, or animals of multiple origins, you eventually want to go to uh, multi-lab uh, experiments. That said, those are awfully rare in, 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 in preclinical science, right? So uh, this is a recent review, still preprint by uh, Mano Lalu group, uh, and they actually like using their criteria to uh, define a multicenter preclinical trial, they found 12 studies in literature, which is hardly anything really, if you think of like how much stuff we have to be tested. And uh, which, so we should be talking a bit about why this, is this not happening and how you build up the, this culture, right? And of course, I think most people would, would, would bring it down to a matter of incentives. I mean, there's not a lot of, I won't say a, not a lot of interest, I don't know about their interest, but like there's definitely not the culture in funding agencies to uh, foster this kind of collaborations. I mean, uh, Brazilian agencies at least are, are very keen on, on, on fostering collaboration, but it's like a collaboration between like 20 groups in which 
if everyone does the same, but like we're not really synthesizing results or joining them together, so you end up like with 20 results from small experiments anyway. Uh, and I think that again speaks to like how we evaluate science. I, I think we're very keen like publishing lots of papers or publishing high impact, highly cited papers, but we hardly ever evaluate science on its rigor. And if you don't evaluate rigor, uh, the natural consequence of this is that people will not really invest time to being uh, rigorous. I think there's uh, mathematical modeling to show that, like this is called the natural selection of bad science. If you, uh, by backup by a, a close Williams of physicist, uh, and if you, you, if you reward uh, a lot of positive results, the easiest way to get that is just like to not be very rigorous in tracking them. So uh, over the long run, uh, effort in confirming findings actually goes down to zero. False positive findings invade the literature. Uh, there's also other stuff showing that uh, at the, with current incentives, you're not really incentivized to build up statistical power. Actually, running a high power study will actually be costly to you in terms of like you publish less. I mean, of course, it'd be more rigorous, but if, if you're not checking, uh, it doesn't really help, right? Uh, that said, I think I, I, I'm in a very privileged position to actually have the funding to explore a little bit what we can do in terms of confirmatory experiments. We got a, a grant from the Sahapi Data Institute uh, three or four years ago. Uh, to actually do a large-scale replication of some experiments in Brazilian biomedical science, which is the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative. It's a multi-center effort to estimate the <clears throat> reproducibility of uh, experiments in Brazilian articles uh, using simple methods, which we had uh, a large enough community of researchers to reproduce. So we're currently trying to reproduce 60 experiments. Uh, is somebody talking to me in the chat? No, no, that's just, yeah, um, I, I, I couldn't see, but... I'm all right, right? You're, you're seeing me and everything. It's okay. It's okay, Olavo. Yeah. I'm following I, the I chat just, to, to see. I, I was just reading the messaging here, just like thought somebody might, might, <clears throat> maybe no one was listening, but okay. So this is the project. Uh, we, we plan to reproduce 60 experiments from published articles over 20 years of Brazilian biomedical literature. And actually, like, the first thing we learned with this is, like, there's actually interest to participate in this. Of course, we had the funding, so that makes things easier. As everybody is underfunded these days in Brazilian science, that makes it even easier because people want, I mean, if somebody is paying to do to, for you to work and you have no money, I think that makes things, uh, in a bad way, but it makes things easier. But we had actually had a lot of, a, a lot of interest. We, we put, out a, put up a public call for labs to join the initiative. We had over 80 registered labs, over three calls in 2018. That's over 45, that's over, there's 45 institutions in 20 states of Brazil, which is pretty much everywhere. If you look at the map, we managed to get 67 into the project because we couldn't do all methods because of funding. But there was actually like a very large community of laboratories, usually young researchers, but like pretty much all ages and all, all regions of Brazil. <clears throat> we currently have 58 active labs. We lost, lost some uh, in the course of the project because stuff happened, especially in the pandemic, a lot of people exchange labs uh, change personnel and just couldn't stay but we're uh we, we were delayed as well but we're, we're, we're on our way uh, so we were currently replicating six year experiments using three methods which are the mtt assay which is a simple very widely used cell viability assay in culture uh, rt pcr which measures mrna expression in tissue or culture and the elevated plasmase which is the task thomas was just talking about in rodents uh so experiments using these three methods using cell lines rest from mice as a model uh, we actually <clears throat> did a full text search of a large random sample of Brazilian articles between 98 and 2017, selected 60 experiments, which we had labs with, that had the expertise to do them. So it's not exactly a random sample, but it's like a, a quasi random sample enriched in simple and cheap experiments, which we could do. Uh, and each experiment gets replicated independently by three different labs with authors blind to the original result. And we're taking actually a very naturalistic approach to reproducibility. Uh, we're not trying to standard. We were uh, consciously not trying to standardize things, and that goes because we, we really wanted to try to do the replication based on the published article. And there's invariably a large, uh, I mean, a large number of gaps. Right? This is what you get. So, biopsy mice were housed in pathogen-free conditions and fed a diet of food and water. And like, what it was the age of the mice, or the sex of them? You don't know like a lot of things. And if we try to standardize that, standardize that we might easily over standardize to something that was actually very unlike the original experiment. So we're trying to do, uh, each lab is, is asked to follow the protocol as closely as possible, but whatever's not in the protocol, uh, each lab is free to, uh, re uh, to to choose how to do it. And of course, to register, right? So we have gaps filled independently by the replicating labs, but we're obsessively reporting them so, so as to get an estimate of 
variability in different steps in uh, in, in in the protocols, and of course, we want to that that, uh, that will allow us to consider interlab variability when we assess replication success. Right, uh, we're halfway through, uh, or maybe a bit more, a bit less. I don't know. Uh, we're very delayed by the pandemic. We should be we should have been finished by by, by this year, but like. Uh, Pretty much every lab closed down at some, some point uh, last year. So experiments are underway since late last year. Uh, they're set to finish by 2022, uh, probably in the second half of the year. Uh, labs are in very different steps of the project. So you can, I mean, this is kind of like our, 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 our spreadsheet that marks the steps. So like a lot of, some people are finished, some people are not even halfway through. But uh, we've learned a lot already just from the process and I think like, as this is not something that usually happens, I think what you learn from the processes might might be uh, as as interesting as what you learn from results. And uh, first thing, this is hard work. I mean, doing the uh, protocols as obsessively registered as, as ours, everything is pre-registered in a very extensive manner. Uh, is uh, this has taken months to do, uh, especially because we had a, an internal uh, peer review round, and then the, the coordinating team asked various questions of stuff that's not clear. Uh, we end up with uh, registered protocols, but it takes uh, months to happen. Again, this might not be feasible for every experiment. Uh, you don't want to really predefine too much in exploratory science, otherwise you just uh, lose your pace of work. And of course, uh, it's very hard to 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 to, to pre-register everything because it's very hard to predict everything's going to happen. So, like you, you sometimes you do protocol decisions based on the original protocol. So, like yeah, we we'll use animals between 90 and 100 days and they expect it to weigh between 150 and 200 grams and then you realize that the animals in your housing facility are actually much heavier than this and worse than that like we had inclusion criteria for the experiment that had to do with like weight loss uh, because it was a, a sleep restriction intervention so the rats had to lose weight uh, within a certain range but of course if they're heavier they were losing much more weight than we expected so we actually had to abandon uh, the inclusion criteria as well so we have a lot of protocol breaches because uh, sometimes it's hard, and uh, I, I think this is interesting. I'm, I'm a very strong believer in pre-registration at some points, but I think it's, it's it's interesting to know the limits. Like sometimes you mess up, and pilot data is very important. Sometimes you really do need to do experiments before get into a final protocol. And that was uh, since we, we thought we did not have to, we would not have to do it because we were actually copying the protocols. But even if you're trying to replicate something directly, sometimes you do need pilot data and some stuff. Second thing. Uh, people were interested in reproducibility. I mean, we had a lot of interest at, uh, on the project by the Brazilian community, we had a lot of jobs, labs joining. Not everyone is really familiar with the, even the very basic procedures or terminology. So like if you ask how people will randomize their animals, sometimes they just like don't understand what randomization actually means. So like what's the method of randomization? They will be randomly divided. Uh, this is not a real method, but it, well, this is actually a, 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 an answer we, we, we frequently got. So like we realized our questions were actually not, our, our, the language we use right, was actually not uh, necessarily familiar to the, to, to the average researcher in the project. So we actually had to take the time to really uh, try to standardize communication and we would have a lot of manuals uh, in all forms for a lot of protocol steps. We thought this would not be as necessary as it was but like from the first meeting, I think we realized uh, how important it, it is to like actually write down what we mean uh, in, in every step. Uh, third thing is like people are not very used to be, uh, I mean, uh, academic researchers are very used to independence. So it's, it's actually not easy to coordinate people like do stuff this way. Uh, people, I, I mean, we, we don't feel comfortable with it and people don't feel comfortable with us telling them what to do. Uh, and actually, like uh, the best way to actually get people to work in the way you envision everybody to be working is actually to give people structured tools, structured forms. Like you don't have to say do do this, do this, do this, but you actually do uh, give them a form and like okay, this is what you have to fill. It's actually much more uh, sympathetic than, than than just trying to give orders. Uh, actually, building tools has been a, a, a part of what we do. We build tools for like randomized samples and plates and stuff. I think that actually adds value to the project. Uh, not everybody is used to very high tech tools. So, like, uh, if uh, like we, we looked at a lot of uh, uh, electronic lab notebooks and other stuff, in the end we have like a standard Google Drive with uh, docs and uh, X, uh, and spreadsheet files because that's what people are used to. And I think, of course, there's a lot of planning to what goes into the forms. But uh, uh, again, technology is a limit. You want to use simple stuff that people are used to.
And uh, the lion's share of the work really has been coordinating people. I mean, communicating and managing is by far the, 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 what, what we spend the most time on. And we realize we're not trained for this. I mean, there's people who have experience in managing a hundred, a thousand people in, in, in industry, but uh, academics are usually not trained to manage more than, than 10 or 15 people in a lab. And the, the way you have to, 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 to communicate with like a lot of people is actually very different. And I think there's actually formal training to be done in order for people to do this better than we do and not have to learn from scratch as we have. Uh, and and, and as, uh, uh, there, there's also training in terms of like people with understanding what collaboration means and what's necessary. So I do have a slightly pessimistic impression that academia in Brazil and perhaps out of it is very often too informal and too futile. I mean, people are not very used to have people come in and tell, okay, this is how you should, how we should be doing things uh, for large corporations to be viable. Uh, I mean, to, to actually do work collaboratively, uh, you following a minimum standard, and we're not standardizing too much. I mean, if you want to do something uh, that's uh, audited uh, in, in more of like a, an equipped fashion, uh, you definitely, I mean, we're, we're very, very far from actually like giving labs accreditation, like really watching what they're doing. Uh, but even these co collaborations as ours, which are somewhat free, do require organizing, communicating efficiently, dividing labor, and sacrificing some independence. I mean, if you want to have big experiments with lots of people, people will be doing less of their own experiments, and uh, most people are not very into it. So, and not if, not everyone's really up to, the, uh, to, to, to that challenge. And I think we have to uh, think of formal incentives for people to be uh, and, and and a formal training for people to be used to this kind of work. I mean. Uh, one of our biggest, biggest, biggest challenges is just like people who do not answer emails. And I'm not talking about one or two emails, like you've talk, tried to reach them for months and you can't find them. So, I mean, uh, eventually we had to like uh, uh, get rid of some labs because we, we would just not know what they were doing. And uh, this is problems we should not be stumbling upon, right? I mean, there's already the hard problem of doing good science. Uh, communicating should be the easy part, but it's not. So I think we, we do need to, to think better of like how, how, how we get academia up to the challenge of, of doing, of, of running these this, this large corporations. Uh, so, and of course, if this is to become routine, we shouldn't be learning from scratch every time we have pushed the rock uphill. Now we're a little bit more used to what works, what doesn't. But I mean, if somebody else is going to start a, the same kind of project in some other area, they'll be learning from scratch as well. So we need to think of better models for this to be sustainable for actually the expertise we and others have gained in running this uh, big science collaborations uh, be used for, for, for further projects, right? Uh, I think there's good examples of bottom-up initiatives that have worked and that have tried to be more permanent in terms of like, okay, we're a permanent consortia that does multi-center study. Genomics, of course, is, is one of the, the, the fields that have been revolutionized by, by, by big consortia. Uh, but there's also this more grassroots initiative, such, such as the Psychological Science Accelerator, which currently has something like 300 labs around the world to like test a specific psychological hypothesis. And they actually do have a very democratic process of how to select uh, what to do, etc. There's also collaborations, and this is many babies from developmental science, many primates from primatology. Of course, these require resources to run, but uh, I, I think with a motivated community that wants to do this uh, on a more permanent level, I think you can actually build up expertise and, 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 and potentialize a lot of further studies if you have people within an area that are very keen on performing large-scale initiatives. We have experiment, and one thing I think this is useful for is that like community-based networks actually have an impact that goes way beyond experiments. I think we have tried to use our network for that and to like not only do experiments that do other things that, 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 that engage people in collaboration, we run uh, hack weeks, uh, meta, meta research hack weeks uh, called No Budget Science Hack Week uh, every year, which are currently online because of the pandemic, but they have been in person at some point, which are in which people actually bring in their ideas for projects to improve science uh, and uh, from any area, uh, they get together for a couple of weeks, they work on that. It's great for community building. It's not that great for project completion because people after Hack Week, they're just kind of like dispersed and very few projects get finished. So we're dealing with that. But I think in terms of like getting people together, getting people exposed to open science, this is awesome. Uh, and we, we plan to keep on doing this, this, this experience just for the, the bringing together part of it. 
We also started uh, recently a, a systematic review and meta-analysis collaboration. This started out with people from the initiative, from with the experimental researchers. We brought, brought some people with more experience uh, in meta-analysis. Uh, we're currently undertaking three projects we were, which were collaboratively defined. We have around 30 members and we're putting up a training program to have annual calls for new members and new projects. So our goal here is to engage experimental research experimental researchers in uh, systematic reviews, uh, both to actually learn how to do something different and to actually reflect on their own practices. And so we should have a first call next year, this is our website. Uh, that said, I mean, even though I'm a big fan of community initiatives, I think at some point, if it gets too complex, we do need the top-down effort as well. I think grassroots initiatives are great, but uh, for something like uh, CERN, I mean, that's not going to happen out of scratch. And I think there's uh, very complex questions in in biomedical science that should be uh, should have have a certain like structure to 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 happen. I mean, let's get together a whole lot of people. Let's build infrastructure. Uh, there's uh, I think there's funding agencies that have been interested in, in building more conformative science. Uh, DARPA has a, a history of of of, of getting to uh, two labs to do the same thing and seeing what happens. Uh, the uh, German Ministry of of of, uh, of Education, I think. Has uh, the, side, the side project with the with the uh, Quest Center in Berlin to try to build up confirmatory structure to confirm uh, preclinical findings from people who apply for confirmatory grants. Uh, and uh, I would do a quick poll, but I think this is in the chat, in the YouTube channel already uh, with the others, so I don't think you have to look at this. So just then, uh, if you actually would like to join in the Brazilian Representative Initiative doing experiments, we do have an open call for participants. It's actually our last one. It's just meant to replace labs that left during the pandemic. So it's like a very few experiments which are currently orphan and have no one to perform them or have only two labs. We need a third. Uh, we're already getting some applications. If you actually do uh, work with the MTT assay or RT-PCR or the elevated plasmase, and you're interested, please take a look at our website and our deadline is the end of the month or until we have fewer positions. So, uh, I mean, when, when we get enough labs, this may close even earlier. But uh, so let us know if you're interested uh, and or let us know if you're interested in anything else. Uh, uh, so this, these are all our, 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 our websites for the different projects. My slides are on this link. I can send it to, to, through the YouTube chat as well. And uh, I thank you for the attention and I'm open for questions as well. Thank you very much, Olavo. Fantastic picture. Uh, I like very much the, the crude but real portrait of, of our feudal <laughs> structure. <laughs> and that, um, well, thank you very much. So, uh, we have time for questions. I'm looking into the... Well, Dr. Sileni uh, stated everyone is so overwhelmed with emails, social media and so on. I imagine that the challenge you all are facing to communicate with so many labs. That's yeah, I, 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 don't, I, I don't think COVID has helped. So, like a lot of people got into really complicated situations uh, with uh, children and sick people and people leaving the lab and not being able to. So, so like, of course, we're, we, we, we try to be very, I mean, we, we, we try to be very light and, 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 and very uh, com understanding of people in terms of like difficulties in, in, in everything. And we've, mm -hmm. we, we've lost our deadlines multiple times and that's. That's pretty much all right. I mean, we can and, and we can. I mean, we couldn't tell people to open their labs. I mean, if you're, they're closed for security reasons, for health uh, reasons, uh, of course we, we we can know. Oh, you have to start now. So like we have we have to have to be very understanding. Uh, still, I think I, I I do expect that people will at least like communicate that kind of difficulty. But uh, some I, I mean we have groups of, like three or four people, and, like no one will respond for like months, and that's weird. I mean that's just uh, uh, I, I I think we lost a few labs just because we couldn't reach them. And uh, I think we can we, we can do better, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's that shouldn't be that hard. Oh, I, I'd like to, to point here with an old people's comment. I'd like to remember that the internet at all was only possible uh, after we solved the TCP TCP IP conundrum. The way the two computers can talk to each other to understand from their different perspectives. This is a protocol. 
and this protocol is so apparently easy. Now we have to develop, and Reza uh, highlight this, to develop a, a different kind of TCP IP if you want to collaboration proceeds to uh, the way we speak to each other. It start as technology and ends as laws, regulations, and forms, and way to, to talk to each other. Fantastic, Olavo. Thank you very much. And I think, well, Bjorn, let's talk. Have you uh, uh, picked some, some of the results of the pools? Exactly. So um, a few people, or two or three, <laughs> um, actually answered the questions. And um, I can share um, this screen. Let's check. So just as a little summary, also a bit discussing this bias again. How easily, and how it's easily also it's sometimes also just sometimes to be, just to be yeah, fooled in yeah, the end. Fooled in um, the for end. example, um, for looking example, at this image, looking at which this image, moon which bigger. moon is bigger. Um, um, and and they are actually they, they are actually the same size. The same size. Uh, but yeah, it's an, an optical illusion. So if I send it to the back and put this bar over it with parallel lines, so they're the same. Um, and this question, how do you think biomedical engineers can contribute to help increase the rigor and reproducibility? I mean, that's something you discussed already, uh, Marino. Uh -huh. um, so increasing statistical rigor, standardization, and collaboration with other areas. Um, let's quickly go to the next slide. And um, here, the horizontal lines. And no matter how often I look at this image, they just don't look parallel. But um, yeah, of course they are, as most of you, or as the three people replying here also suggested. And that's also kind of a question, which city is more southern? Is it Barcelona or in Spain or Tokyo in Japan? And if I always think of the world map and Barcelona more the a warmer country, Mediterranean and then Japan, um, but rather snow. But um, indeed, like these two people indicated here, Tokyo is more southern. Um, and yeah, here this question about did you ever buy something on sale even though you didn't need it? I think it's also kind of a nice <laughs> indication that we don't always do the best thing and we have this inner desire to probably yeah um, sometimes do the thing that is not even better. And um, I've of course also I've bought things I didn't need as people indicate here. Um, and then this question was about storing data and here, how is it handled at home um, with the bank account and the regular statements that are received in a paper or digital format and how long they are kept. Um, and indeed, so one person doesn't keep it at all um, or one for one year and um, only one for longer than three years. So, um, yeah. And then here, this was a bit more serious than here. Please rate the following statement. So I'm using unique experimental identifiers. And um, so here one person uh, disagreed, is not using it. Whereas then uh, two said, yeah, they are neutral about it. So I think they applying it, but maybe not consistent enough. I don't know. Um, that would be something that we could this discuss now also with with these uh, uh, people. Um, I have a system allowing to identify the raw data from a figure in my publication. So that apparently is in most cases not possible. And then also storing a um, lab notebook for longer than 10 years. That's also um, apparently not the case. And um, then here this question um, from a private in a private setting, so um, if you want 
if somebody asks for a recipe for the cake, so how do you actually provide the the baking protocol, right? And indeed, um, so two people at least said, uh, well, I have a detailed written <laughs> protocol to share it, which of course also makes makes sense. Um, and these were the questions from you, um, Olavo. Um, what kind of experience do you have with multi-center collaborations? And um, indeed, so two indicated no experience and one um, participate performing uh, in it. And would, what would motivate you to particip participate in a large uh, scale multi-center collaboration? So the learning opportunity or the authorship was given here. So yeah, quite quite interesting responses I find, and um, um, so maybe again would be interesting for us also to know: Do you enjoy such questions? Does it make make sense? So um, also again, if you want to comment on it, um, I will put a link in the chat where you can also. Um, um, uh, evaluate this workshop and what you think of it and there's also a commentary function or a, a text field where you can comment so if you leave any comments for us it would be really helpful so that we can also yeah Im improve the workshop uh, prepare other content or keep the content mm -hmm. so any feedback would also be uh, interesting for us Yes. Well, uh, we had a few res uh, few responses, but sure, uh, most of these questions goes to the heart of our problem here. Um, it's most of them tackle neuroscientific problems on how perception goes, how we see things how uh, form our opinions, how we get our decisions. When you put this, we think about this, we can do better um, with our tools to understand the world. That's it. That's about it. Um, yeah. uh, we see how emotions like publish or perish uh, can affect the way you see the things, the way you take your decisions. That's why these questions are there. And that's why we are struggling to improve our doing of the things. So, fantastic. Please, help us. And uh, you, you can reflect on, you can think on your response to these questions. Fantastic. Makes a lot of sense. So, thank you very much, Al. I think it's time we would like to get this this discussion on. It's so rich, so important, so relevant. So, um, well, I, I saw this is not just for biomedical engineers or uh, life scientists. Uh, uh, it's more of this. It's more relevant how we, what we are discussing here. Thank you very much. I think if you agree, we can end our uh, presentations now. And well, let's get in touch. Let's let's work. Thank you very yeah, much, yeah, Enza, thank you. Gjorn, thank you, Olavo, thank you very much, Dr. Thomas, fantastic, and uh, Dr. Malcolm is, who is not with us now, but thank you very much. You're and welcome. Flavinho, thank you very much, too. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. I'll be the last one. Thank you, Anza.